I think it's very timely that I'm talking to you and doing this interview. There is so much about your work, your story, your the work that you're putting out now that um, is what I need to hear. Mm. And so, you know, I'm sitting here in a home that we were building in Southern Vermont. And about two and a half years ago, I had a cracking, if you will. I think that's the word that you use too, where I'm like, I can't keep going like this. I've got to make some changes. I can't continue to be a workaholic. I cannot be racing all over the place. Like I have got to make some changes. And so now I am sitting here in my new home that is still under construction. And we've just sold our home of 24 years outside of Boston. And I, for the first time in 23 years, am experiencing such devastating anxiety about all the changes that I've put in place Mm. that, um, I've literally spent the last two weeks completely disassociated and I went back on medication and um, I, I'm having this experience where it's almost like I'm on a really bad drug trip and I know <laughs> that it's going to end and that the feelings are going to level out and yet I, I want the feelings to stop. Well, first of all, I'm so proud of you for getting back on the meds. It's there's a time and season. Yes, that's true. That's and true. as trauma survivors, we get activated when big change happens. Mm, I hadn't even thought about the fact that it has a link to all the trauma I've been working on. That is the whole thing. And that's why your book happy days was just like, holy cow. I mean, this just landed right in my lap at right the right time because I, why don't you tell the story about how, um, because I found the introduction of the book really interesting about how this actually started in 2016. Yeah. Well, it's not dissimilar to what you're referencing. And I'll begin by saying that Actually, let me first just speak back to you and then I'm going to share that story. So I want to say, I want to send a lot of compassion and gratitude to the dissociated part because that part of you has done a really good job just getting by each day. Gratitude to the anxious part, love and compassion to the anxious part for revealing that you need a little extra support right now as you do deeper work. Okay. And just hold you there because there's when we've been there and then we come back, it's like, there's shame around that. There's so much terror around that, but it's, it's a beautiful witnessing to see that these parts of you are coming up to give you information. And I just want to honor you for that. Self is qualities of curiosity. Hmm. And so there's three questions you can start to ask yourself in the moment when the anxiety comes up. Instead of pushing the anxiety down, you can befriend it. And you can ask three questions. You can say, okay, what do I notice about the anxiety? So where does it live in my body? Would you want to do it with me right now? Sure. Okay. Are you connected to the anxiety in this moment? Not this moment, but I, okay. I, is there I, something I'm else familiar with it? So I'm more, well, than is there anything else that might be up right now that, uh, that's, that's a protector part that you're like, I want to kind of talk, talk, talk to. Um, it's interesting now that we're talking about it. I feel a little anxious. Okay. Okay. So it's I, I'm so programmed to run that staying still which is what this new house in Southern Vermont represents, this real quiet place. I feel tingly all over right now. Okay. So there's a tingly, a desire to run, and then like this little anxiety kind of right back in the background. Completely. 
Okay, cool. Could we ask the tingliness and the desire to run to maybe just go in the the go out on the patio and have a coffee and just, or have a cup of tea and just take a take a minute just to give us a little space to talk to the anxiety. Would that would that be okay with them? Sure. Okay. So just taking a moment to check in. You can close your eyes if you want. You can breathe, whatever you need, but just check in gently with the anxiety and ask. Where is it in the body? Right here. Right in your chest. Yeah, very. Yeah, like gripping like that. Gripping. Any other ways you would define it? Colors, shapes. Uh it's um like kind of hands like this. And it's I'm also really warm under my armpits, but I'm not sure if that's menopause shit happening or what. But okay. This and then right here. Tight, warm. Mm-hmm. Does it have an age or a gender? Oh, female and older. Older. Okay. Yeah. Like older than you are now? Yeah, I think. Oh. I don't know. I don't think of myself as 50s, but. No, but is it like when you say older, like 80s or like. Older, uh, I like... feel like these like witch hands. It's really fun. Witchy. Weird. Yeah. Witchy. Okay, cool. Witchy. Anything else that you notice about it? As I talk about it, it sort of like pulls back a little. Okay. What do you know about it? Uh, it's familiar. Does it have any stories or, or uh, visuals that attach to it? And more like the first words that came to mind is, I don't like this. I don't want to be here. Okay, that's uh, a problem. The, the part that's coming in that's saying, I don't like this, I don't want to be there is another part. Hmm. It's a protector. Would that protector feel safe enough to go have some tea for a moment? <laughs> yeah. I'll send that protector outside the office. Hang yeah. On. See and sitting. I want to thank that protector and just let that protector know that I've totally got you and I'm not going to take anxiety to anywhere that they don't need to go. Mm-hmm. Really high level right here. We're not going to go anywhere we shouldn't go today. Okay, I just want to give thank that protector for coming in and and just say, have a tea, but thank you so much for speaking up. Thank you. So with a little bit more permission, just to talk to this part, what is the part, the anxious part need? Um, I, the first thing that came up was a hug reassurance, um, that I don't have to do this on my own. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Does that part of you know that you are here, that yourself, that your resourced, undamaged self, does it know that you're here? I think so. I okay. think so. And the reason why I say it like that is because I think one of the things that I've been struggling with for so long because of workaholism and being busy uh, and on the move as kind of my go-to protector. Um, As long as I'm on the move, I'm going to be okay. As long as I'm busy. um, I have had a deep feeling of loneliness. Yeah. Yeah. So the part. Yeah. Being in a quiet place up here makes me feel really lonely. Okay. Okay. Thank you for saying that. How do you feel towards the part? I feel sad towards her, you know, tired of feeling lonely. I get it. It's painful. So she knows you're here and you have some compassion for her. So I don't want to put the words in your mouth, but yeah. Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Beautiful. If she wasn't in such an extreme role of doing, doing and anxious, anxious, what what else would she be doing? She'd be hanging out with her friends, hanging out with her friends. Okay. She'd be, uh, doing fun shit. I don't know. Going for a hike, going for a hike. Okay. Would you be there self? Okay. In your own mind's eye, can you just take a moment to just 
visualize taking her by the hand and, and or however it visualizes for you, however it comes to your vision. Mm-hmm. Taking her on that hike. Mm-hmm. See who is around. See whatever comes up. You can tell me whatever comes up, whatever you want to share. I can totally see it. Totally. There's a black bear that uh, is out with her cubs up there. And so I just see us walking down the path and there's the black bear. How does she feel with you on the hike? Happy that I'm there. Yeah. And is there anything that you want to say to her on this hike? I'm not going anywhere. (laughs) Can you make a commitment to her right now that when you notice her, you can just take her by the hand and go on the hike and remind her that you're not going anywhere? Is when you say notice her, are you talking about when that feeling comes back? Is that yeah. what you mean? Yeah. Yeah. When the anxiety yeah. starts to come in, can you just yeah. let her know? I can, I am not going to let you be there alone. Right. And make a commitment maybe that you'll just take her on that hike. Maybe even literally, maybe even literally go for a hike with her. Totally. Totally. Beautiful. How does she feel now just to close it out? How does she feel? Um, I think some of the protectors have come back in. Okay. That's okay. They're welcome back. They're welcome back, Mel, because they're like, I don't want to go to hike. You know, like, that's okay. That's okay. They're welcome back. I want to thank them for stepping aside for the time that they did. They did a beautiful job. They are welcome back. We can always ask them to step aside when there's some space, but right now it's okay. They can come back. You now have, what you have right now, Mel, is direct access from self to the part. It's so beautiful to witness. You have direct access from your adult resourced internal parent self to the part of you that's so protective and anxious. And you've you've given her a full media alert that you are available to her when she needs you. Yeah. Major step forward. What are the steps? Like, how do you begin? Like, I think a lot of people can relate to the cracking because I, you know, as you were telling the story of 2016, like, you know, I I can't, for me, I have been saying for two years, I, I can't handle one more thing. Like, I can't, I can't keep, I can't keep operating like this. I can't. So how does somebody recognize, number one, that there is that cracking? And number two, what is the next best couple things just to get started? Because obviously it's a long, slow, deep healing journey. It is. It's it's a long, slow, deep healing journey. But what one of my readers said to me today in an interview, she said, I feel like happy days will take five to 10 years off of your therapy because it, it, the, with the direction and the awareness and the understanding, it actually just fast forwards things p- for people because y- it, it takes away all of the time that you need to figure it out. And then you can go deeper, but first steps for how do you know you're cracking into something? And this doesn't necessarily mean that you are remembering something that you dissociated from, but that you're accepting something that you've been running from. One is to accept that we're all running. Two, it's to start to witness some of the, notice some of the behavioral patterns, triggers, and the ways that you respond to them. So First, at first, we can kind of begin to take an inventory of like the responses, right? The the act, the the extreme ways that we react. So, are you turning to drugs and alcohol? Are you overworking? Are you burning yourself out? Are you f- feeling extreme gastrointestinal issues? Are you having insomnia? Are you having a lot of physical conditions that you can't get a diagnosis for? Are you having extreme anxiety? Are you struggling to, you know, not rage out out of nowhere? Well, one of your theses is that I love because it's very hopeful and it's true is that there is a, this, you talk about the self with the capital S and that there is a returning to that that is desired by all of us. And in many ways for me, this book felt 
not as much about trauma as it did about spirituality, because you can list all those negative things, but the flip side of this is that there is this, as you say, calm, confident, that there is a person in a self energy inside of you that you're trying to get back to. Yeah. And the cracking is a moment when you realize that all this running that you've been doing away from that calm, compassionate, confident self is no longer working. Yeah. In many ways, the cracking is a great sign because it it's feel like it. <laughs> it definitely doesn't feel like it, but it's a great sign much as my therapist said, I said, why did I remember this now? I was 36 years old. And by the way, statistics show that most people don't remember their dissociated trauma until their fifties. Really? Yep. Wow. I think it like the stat was like 80% or something crazy. My therapist told me. So when we, when we're cracking, what's happening is in my therapist's case, she said, you were safe enough to remember you had gotten yourself to enough safety to remember. So I want to, once again, applaud you because all the work that you've done on yourself, decades of devotional work that you've done for yourself and shared with the world has gotten you to a place where you're safe enough now to crack into more. And it's fucking terrifying, but the best advice I could give anyone right out of the bat is to start to connect to that self energy. So how? So self is there. Self is re ready to go. It's this lo totally loyal parent that's just ready to pick you up in, in the second that you ask for help. Self is qualities of curiosity. Hmm. And so there's three questions you can start to ask yourself in the moment when the anxiety comes up. Instead of pushing the anxiety down, you can befriend it. And you can ask three questions. You can say, okay, what do I notice about the anxiety? So where does it live in my body? Would you want to do it with me right now? Just sure. Okay. Sure. Are you connected to the anxiety in this moment? Not in this moment, but okay. I, okay. I, is there I, something I'm else? I'm familiar with it, so I'm more Well, than is there anything else that might be up right now that... Uh, that's, that's a protector part that you're like, I want to kind of talk, talk to. Um, it's interesting now that we're talking about it, I feel a little anxious. Okay. Okay. So it's I, I'm so programmed to run that staying still, which is what this new house in Southern Vermont represents this real quiet place. I feel tingly all over right now. Okay. So there's a tingly, a desire to run, and then like this little anxiety kind of right back in the background. Completely. Okay, cool. Could we ask the tingliness and the desire to run to maybe just go in the, the go out on the patio and have a coffee and just, or have a cup of tea and just take a, take a minute just to give us a little space to talk to the anxiety. Would that, would that be okay with them? Sure. Okay. So just taking a moment to check in, you can close your eyes if you want, you can breathe, whatever you need, but just check in gently with the anxiety and ask, where is it in the body? Right here. Right in your chest. Like, yeah, right. yeah. Like gripping like that. Gripping any other ways you would define it, colors, shapes. Ah. Uh... It's um, like kind of hands like this. And it's, I'm also really warm under my armpits, but I'm not sure if that's menopause shit happening or what. But okay. Like this and then right here. Tight, warm. Mm -hmm. Does it have an age or a gender? Oh, female and older. Older. Okay. Yeah. Like older than you are now? Yeah, I think. Oh. I don't know. I don't think of myself as 50s, but... No, but is it like when you say older, like eighties or like, older, uh, I like, feel like these like witch hands. It's really fun. Witchy. Weird. Yeah. Witchy. Okay, cool. Witchy. Anything else that you notice about it? Uh, 
as I talk about it, it sort of like pulls back a little. Okay. What do you know about it? Uh, it's familiar. Does it have any stories or, or uh, visuals that attach to it? And more like the first words that came to mind is I don't like this. I don't want to be here. Okay. That's uh -huh. a the, the part that's coming in that's saying, I don't like this. I don't want to be there is another part. Mm. It's a protector. Would that protector feel safe enough to go have some tea for a moment? <laughs> yeah. I'll send that protector outside the office. Hang yeah. On. I see and sick. I want to thank that protector and just let that protector know that I've totally got you and I'm not going to take anxiety to anywhere that they don't need to go really mm -hmm. high level right here. We're not going to go anywhere. We shouldn't go today. Okay. I just want to give, th thank that protector for coming in and, and just say, have a tea, but thank you so much for speaking up. Thank you. So with a little bit more permission, just to talk to this part, what is the part, the anxious part need? Um, I, the first thing that came up was a hug reassurance um, that I don't have to do this on my own. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Does that part of you know that you are here, that yourself, that your resourced undamaged self, does it know that you're here? I think so. I okay. think so. And the reason why I say it like that is because I think one of the things that I've been struggling with for so long, because of workaholism and being busy uh, and on the move as kind of my go-to protector. Um, as long as I'm on the move, I'm gonna be okay. As long as I'm busy. Um, I have had a deep feeling of loneliness. Yeah, yeah. So the and part- I, Yeah, being in a quiet place up here makes me feel really lonely. Okay. Okay. Thank you for saying that. How do you feel towards the part? I feel sad towards her, you know, tired of feeling lonely. I get it. It's painful. So she knows you're here and you have some compassion for her. Is that, I don't want to put the words in your mouth. But yeah. Oh, sure. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Beautiful. If she wasn't in such an extreme role of doing, doing and anxious, anxious, yeah. what, what else would she be doing? She'd be hanging out with her friends, hanging out with her friends. Okay. A lot. She'd be, uh, doing fun shit. I don't know. Going for a hike, going for a hike. Okay. Would you be there self? Yeah. Okay. In your own mind's eye, can you just take a moment to just visualize taking her by the hand and, and or however it visualizes for you, however it comes to your vision, mm -hmm. taking her on that hike, mm -hmm. see who's around, see whatever comes up. You can tell me whatever comes up, whatever you want to share. I can totally see it. Totally. There's a black bear that uh, is out with her cubs up there. And so I just see us walking down the path and there's the black bear. How does she feel with you on the hike? Happy that I'm there. Yeah. And is there anything that you want to say to her on this hike? I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> Can you make a commitment to her right now that when you notice her, you can just take her by the hand and go on the hike and remind her that you're not going anywhere. Is when you say notice her, are you talking about when that feeling comes back? Is that yeah. what you mean? Yeah. Yeah. When the anxiety yeah. starts to come in, can you just yeah. let her know? I can, I am not going to let you be there alone. Right. And make a commitment maybe that you'll just take her on that hike. I'll maybe even literally, hand. maybe even literally <laughs> go for a hike with her. Totally. totally. Beautiful. How does she feel now just to close it out? How does she feel? Um, I 
I think some of the protectors have come back in. Okay. <laughs> That's okay. They're welcome back. They're welcome back, Mel, because they're like, they're not, eh, no, I don't want to go back. You know, like, <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. They're welcome back. I want to thank them for stepping aside for the time that they did. They did a beautiful job. They are welcome back. We can always ask them to step aside when there's some space, but right now it's okay. They can come back. And you now have what you have right now, Mel, is direct access from self to the part. It's so beautiful to witness. You have direct access from your adult resourced internal parent self to the part of you that's so protective and anxious. And you've, you've given her a full media alert that you are available to her when she needs you. Yeah. Major step forward. I want to just unpack that uh, for everybody that's watching this and listening. And that is that um, here's what I got from it. When you feel the anxiety take over, take a breath, go into your body, locate where it is. Notice. Notice it. Notice it. And then you had me visualize the color or the gender or the shape of it. That's getting to know. What do I know about it? Mm -hmm. What do I know about it? And then you um, asked me if I had had other experiences where I had felt the same thing. Is that the next thing that happened? We go into what does it need? What does it need? What does it need? And I said a hug. <laughs> Usually what you'll hear when you ask yeah. parts what they need, they'll say, I need to play. I need a hug. I need mm. to be creative. I need, it's always the stuff that we want as a kid. The stuff we didn't get. You actually write about this in your book with your son, yeah. the four S's. What are they? Yeah. So this IFS is broken down in chapter seven, which is called love every part. And then there's another chapter called reparenting yourself where I had this massive aha moment that all the parenting advice that I was getting from Dan Siegel and all the beautiful psychologists out there that, are, that do therapy for children was so profound when working and co co-creating with my son. And I thought to myself, well, nobody ever did this for me. And instead of being pissed about that, I said, wait a second, I can do that for me. I can give myself that hug. I can use the four S's, as Dan says, to be seen, safe, soothed, and secure. I can create that environment for myself internally. That was a big change for me. That was a big turning point. One of the things that you also introduce is this uh, heart hold. So can yes. you walk everybody through that? Because I think that is a way mm -hmm. that you can provide those things to yourself. Yes, absolutely. And it's actually something I really want to recommend to you right now, because when I was cracking, this hold was something that really, really helped me on a moment to moment basis. So placing your hand on your heart and your other hand on your belly, and just notice which hand is most natural to your heart. For me, it's the right. Yeah, the right. You just went right to the right. So it's the right. Some people it's the left. So you really have to decide what's right for you. The other hand on the belly and just take a deep breath in and extend your diaphragm. And on the exhale, just relax your diaphragm and just keep with that belly breath, taking a deep breath in and letting it go. Another deep breath in and let it go. And you might even affirm things to yourself. I'm safe right now. I have so much compassion towards all of my parts. My self energy is here with me. Even just doing the hold is enough right now to settle my system, to help me get back into that parasympathetic state, to just feel relief. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. Go to it all day. It's Another, nice on the belly too. Really nice. Really nice. Another one would be tapping on the gamut point. So there's a point between the ring finger and the middle finger called the gamut. On the point. outside of the hand, right? On the back side of the hand. Yep. And I like to call this point the holy shit point. When I was early in the trauma recovery, I was terrified of getting in an elevator. Why? It's out of control, right? Really? 
Oh yeah. Oh yeah. The elevator, I was in coming out of the trauma and the elevator was just the scariest thing for me. So I had to do this, you know, there was times I had to get in an elevator. And so I was tapping that point. And what does that do? This point sends a message to the amygdala that it's safe to relax. When you tap that point, you also want to take the benefit of affirming the desired feeling. I am safe. I am safe. Hmm. I am safe. Wow. That's so cool. So how long did that last to be nervous about getting into an elevator? A few months, a few months. I did a lot of EMDR, which I write about in the book. Eye movement sensitization okay. and reprocessing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Really beneficial. Could be great when you're in a crisis. Just, and by the way, offline, I have a person for you. Oh, right? I, I'm already doing it. Good. Good. Yes, you're right. It is extremely, extremely it helpful. Gives you this, it gives you a, a settled sense of safety and helps you reprocess even the minor things in the moment. And the stuff that we just did, the body work, that's based on somatic experiencing, which is a body-based trauma therapy. And so as you can see, there's a through line between all the therapies that I chose. And that is, I believe that they're all very therapeutic yet spiritual practices. So let's the, talk about that. Can yeah. Because I, I found your, your book and your work, especially as it's evolved, to be really profound in the spiritual connection to mental health, to healing. And so mm. how would you describe that? The therapies that I was drawn to, I know my guide spirit, God led me to them because they were going to resonate with me most. And the reason I believe that they have such strong spiritual undertones is IFS, connect, connect to self. So for years, I was speaking, teaching A Course in Miracles. We have the ego and we have our higher self and our higher self can dissolve the ego through the experience of forgiveness. Protector parts, self energy, self can dissolve through compassion, forgiveness, courage, creativity. It's all the same thing. Just a different way of accessing it. Uh, the EMDR I loved so deeply because it allowed me to work with the subconscious. Mm. And to not have to recall big things, but just allow. I fell deeply, madly in love with somatic experiencing because it let my body do the work, which is a very spiritual experience. And it got me out of the storyline and into the body. And I believe that the people who founded, particularly knowing some of them, I think that they're very spiritual people, though they may not be able to admit that in their clinical environments. <laughs> but uh there's so there's there's such a through line, and um, I also just believe that God gives us what we can, what we can handle, but also what we resonate with. Well, can we connect the dots between what you just said about God giving you not only what you can handle but what you resonate with, and the fact that you are somebody that people around the world come to for uh, learning how to manifest, right? And talk to me and us, you know, anybody who's watching about the connection between manifesting and this cracking open, that you are attracting something that you need when yeah. you go down this journey. Well, what I'm really proud of is that my books on manifesting aren't really manifesting light. They're, they're deep books, like Super Attractor, Manifest a Life Beyond Your Wildest Dreams. Okay, I hooked you in, <laughs> but now I get you to work. And these books, the universe has your back. These are books on how to manifest, but they're books on how to undo the blocks to the presence of that super attractor power that we all have. Yes. And so the more we crack, the more we crack open to. Amma said that, and Amma the hugging saint, she said that when an eggshell cracks from the outside, it's broken. But when it cracks from the inside, it's reborn. Mm. So that cracking is rebirthing into the truth of who you are, the self within you, the super attractor power within you. And when you, the more you release the blocks to the presence of that self energy, the closer you get to becoming just a, a, a more aligned human. And when I say aligned human, I mean a human having a human experience with a direct line to higher level consciousness, whether you call that compassion, courage, curiosity, today, yeah. it's all that 
capital S self energy. That's right. Is what you're talking about. So which is the same as spiritual energy, which is the same as listening to a spirit guide, which is the same as it's the, it's the voice of love. It's the, it's, it's the undamaged resource soul of who we are. I think that's the simplest way to say it, that trauma is blocking you from accessing the source of who you are. Yes. And that is love. And let's just call it unresolved trauma is the block because the trauma when transcended can be one of the greatest gifts you've ever received. And so I wanna go back to what we were talking about because this is super important for everybody that just walked in the room to hear. So we were talking about, Heidi had asked a question about imposter syndrome. And so I wanna bring you all into this conversation because this is critical for you to hear. It's critical for you to learn these simple tools. Uh, that as she's successful, as she's making stuff happen, she has this nagging voice in her head that's like, you don't deserve this. This is gonna get taken away. You know, you're an imposter, people are gonna find out. Like this nagging thing that is beating her down, even as she's trying to rise up. Can you guys relate to that? Okay, terrific. And so, well, not terrific. I don't want that voice in your head, but I'm glad that you can relate to what we're talking about. So I'm like, we gotta go to war with that voice. And I want today to be a line in the sand where you will look back on today and you'll go, okay, there was a before I heard this conversation and there was an after. And so the first thing that I want you to do is I invented something called the five second rule where you count backwards, five, four, three, two, one. It's a little brain trick where it interrupts all the nastiness and the patterns and old habits here that hold you back. And by the time you count backwards, five, four, three, two, one, you awaken this part of your brain and you are immediately in control of what you think and do next. And one of the best uses for this thing, and you're gonna hear me talk about it on the big stage and I'm gonna show you some examples of how people are using this around the world. One of the best uses is to silence the critic in your head, to interrupt that nagging voice. And one of the other things I want you to understand is that your brain is a supercomputer and your brain loves patterns. And all those little thoughts that you have are just a pattern. And guess what? It's a pattern somebody else taught you. It's a pattern that a caregiver or a parent or a bully or society at large taught you that made you feel less than or unworthy. And it is time to kick that bully out of your freaking head. And the thing that's important about this, and this is like hand-to-hand -hand combat with your own mind, is that if that pattern is not broken and replaced, that pattern will repeat. And for some of us, what I've started to realize in my own life is that I'm just repeating thought patterns that my great-grandmother had and my grandmother had, and then she taught them to my mother, and then my mother said them to me. And I have an opportunity to end that garbage, that I have an opportunity to speak to myself differently. And so step number one is I need you to recognize that. So how many of you in the back row can, are tracking with what I'm saying? Give me a hand in the air so I know. Okay, great. Um, second thing, when you notice, oh, there's that thing again, you're gonna count backwards, five, four, three, two, one. That is the second part of this. So we're gonna notice it, we're gonna count backwards to interrupt it, now we're gonna name it, okay? So I want you to close your eyes, I've already asked everybody in the room to close their eyes. Think about that nasty, awful, disgusting, oh, I hate, ugh, you know, kind of thing. You can make it funny, you can make it gross, you could be a real person. And I want you to think of a name that we're gonna call this voice. When my son was struggling with anxiety, he called anxiety Oliver. And he made Oliver look like a big old pimply eighth grader who was miserable, right? And whenever the, the voice would come on, he would go, all right, Oliver, you're not invited to the sleepover. I'm gonna go, Oliver, I'm not taking you to school with me today. And there's a lot of science behind this because by naming it and picturing something, whether it's broccoli, somebody in the room said she hates broccoli, so the voice is broccoli, you distance yourself. This is the power of objectivity. So right here, what's the name of your voice? Ollie. What is it, Ollie? Ollie? Ollie, okay, great, right here with the, with the pins, cute pins, yes. Maria, Maria's the voice? Okay, Maria, get out of here. White blazer. Tomatoes, okay, excellent. She hates tomatoes, apparently. Um, and here's the thing, have any of you ever had a puppy? Okay, great. Have you ever tried to train a puppy on a leash? Right, and the puppy just wanders all over the place? Mm -hmm. This is another analogy for your mind. Think about your thoughts and your mind like a puppy on a leash. The best way to get a puppy to calm down is to just step on the leash. That's what we're doing. 
when your mind starts to wander and tomato and broccoli and, you know, Maria and Bob show up, five, four, three, two, one, get out of here, Bob. That's how you're going to step on the leaf. You're going to pull your thoughts right back to your own. And then you want to replace it. You want to replace it. And you can replace it in the beginning by just saying, I'm not thinking about that. You're not going to talk to me like that. Okay? Awesome. Um, because if you allow that voice to stay, it will just continue. And as you get sick more and more and more successful, you will take that voice with you. And you will never truly reach not only your potential, but you will also not have the fulfillment and happiness that you deserve. And it begins with what you're saying up here. And we all do it. You're not alone. If I were to put a speaker on everybody's head in here and turn up the volume, you wouldn't be sitting here. We'd all be on an inpatient unit somewhere because, you know, like that, the way we talk to ourselves is really awful. Really awful. I agree, right? Yes, exactly. Okay, another question. Thank you for that. Right here. Um, I'm going through like a little existential crisis, I would say. I'm trying to decide between what I need and what I want. Oh. Earlier, like five minutes before I came in, I got a, the job opportunity that I applied for. However, the job that I have now is what I love doing, and that's why I changed my major. But the job that I was just offered and I accepted will help me pay for rent and living more than the job that I have. And it's like I can take both jobs. I have two jobs now. Uh huh. But it would mean that instead of working 20 hours, I'd be working 38. And I'm a full-time college student. And yep. I don't want to burn myself out. But at the same time, I don't want to not pursue what I have now because I need to make ends meet yeah. living-wise. Yeah. Okay, it's an excellent question. How many of you can relate to this? Yeah, the conflict between what your heart longs for versus, like, what is the responsible thing to do. So I'm going to give you a couple tools to think about decision-making, everybody. Okay? Because sometimes you just have to do whatever you need to do to make the ends meet, right? Sometimes that's what you have to do, but not always, not always. I don't think we live in a very, I, think, I don't think we live in a rigid world. I think we relate to the world like it is. And so one of the tools I use a lot is I try to switch myself from an either or mentality into an and mentality. So how could I take that job that is gonna help me pay my bills and help me feel secure and help me feel like I am making all these ends meet because there is a level of stress that you feel that is so distracting and devastating when you cannot pay your bills. And I know that stress because just 14 years ago, my husband and I were $800,000 in debt. His restaurant business had gone under. I was unemployed. We were about to lose the house. I could not pay for groceries. We had to pull our kids from that town soccer program because we couldn't afford it. And the stress was so excruciating that I literally couldn't get out of bed. In fact, that's how I invented the five second rule. I would lay in bed every morning and the anxiety was like a gravity blanket. And I would stare at the ceiling and my mind would just spiral. It's like I, could not, I did not know to step on a leash. I did not know what to do. And so that's whole five, four, three, two, one came during a rock bottom moment. Like I knew I needed to get out of bed. I just didn't know how. And so the counting became the how. And so what I want you to do, though, is I want you to think, is there a way to do both? Could you accept the job so that you have, or you've already accepted it, but could you accept that job and be happy about it and empowered and go back to what you're doing now and say, can I do this but only X number of hours? So that you still have a foot in something that, that fills your soul versus going, it can only be this or that. Does that make sense? Okay, good. So have that conversation because then you keep a door open to something. The second thing I would do, and this is really important, everybody. So I partnered with LinkedIn and we've launched this uh, course all about confidence. So we can talk a little bit about confidence, what it is, what it isn't, how to build it. And the other thing that I did with them is I was the host of this big thing they called the future of work. And one of the things that I heard loud and clear is that the most important thing that you can invest in, in any job that you have, is skills. 
So if you're going to go into a technical job, like you're going to be a chemist or you're going to be uh, in pharma or you're going to be a doctor or you're going to be an engineer, there's a certain level of expertise that you need in order to do that job. But the vast majority of jobs, of businesses you might start, of all the things that you might do, are all about skills. Can you speak in public? Can you present your ideas? Can you write something? Can you sell somebody on an idea? Like skills, can you connect with people? Are you inspiring and uplifting with people? Skills that you can learn on any job. And so the second piece of advice I'm gonna give you is this. I want you to think about what is it about the job that you have now that really fills your soul? The opportunity to give me, like the job I have now is how I got here with the cauldron on the rise and it's opened so many doors for me. And you, it feels like, like I can almost feel you getting emotional as you think about it. Yeah, it's just, it's, it's what made me change my major. I was a political, political science major and then I got the programming job that I have now with SGA as a public relations officer. Amazing. And now I switched my major to communications with a concentration in sports and management because I love planning events and stuff. Amazing. And that's why, even though it's fun and it, it, it's, it doesn't hit bills, it doesn't, but it's fun and it makes me happy and it alleviates the stress of having to make ends meet. The other job, which is not as fun, will make ends meet. Yep. And the stress of not having to worry about rent every month, especially the way the housing is working. Yeah, in yeah. It's like, what do I have to do? It's like. Well, I, I, what I'm telling you is I think you can figure out a way to do both without working that many hours. And I also think if you love the event planning and you love the communication, here's a great tip, everybody. Look for opportunities inside whatever you're doing now to do more of what you love. So every job, even if it's boring as you know what, they need help with social media marketing. They probably have some sort of something going on, whether it's an employee gathering that you can raise your hand for and help out so that you bring some of the stuff that you love into the day-to-day -day of what you're doing. Does that make sense? Yeah. Awesome. And here's the final thing. I believe that when you are born, you are hardwired with an inner compass. It's like your own Google Maps or Waze system. And I'm gonna prove it to you, okay? So have you ever thought about the odds of you actually being born? Because here's the thing, that, believe it or not, a bunch of psych scientists calculated the odds. What are the odds? with, I know this is kind of gross, but all the sperm that your dad has, who wants to think about that? And eggs that your mom has, and the number of times that they fooled around and all that stuff, you know what I'm saying? What are the odds of that one sperm and that one egg coming together and actually creating you? One in 400 trillion. One in 400 trillion. And here's some really interesting research. We now know that it wasn't about how fast that thing swam, we know that it was the egg. The egg was choosy. And guess what? The egg chose you. Absolutely. Absolutely. You are here for a reason. And I want you to embrace that you are here for a reason. And when you are born into this world, all of that magic that makes you a miracle gets hardwired into your DNA. And it is part of the wiring in your body. And your body is a system of signals that are trying to get you to turn in the direction that's meant for you. And so you were talking about needs, right? There are signals in your body that signal your need. So for example, uh, you gotta eat or else you're gonna die. So what is the signal that you feel? What do you feel when you need food? Hungry. Correct. What do you feel when you need sleep? Yeah. What do you feel when you need connection with other human beings? Yes. What do you feel when, uh, you know, you, uh, you, you need some water? Exactly. Exactly. And here's something that's really interesting. Feeling stuck and feeling lost are also signals. When you feel stuck and you feel lost in your life, it means you've stopped growing. You are gonna grow for your entire life. Until the day you die, your brain can learn new patterns. And so I want you to understand that your body is always trying to signal you. I am going to walk you through step-by-step step how I am using cold exposure therapy or polar plunges or ice baths 
to learn how to heal a dysregulated nervous system. And so what we're going to do um, is we are going to uh, invite you to ask questions. I'm going to teach a little bit, and then I am going to walk you through, and you're going to see me live as I climb into a barrel of 34-degree water. There's my husband, Christopher Robbins. Um, and... Uh, I'm going to wa- I'm going to climb into this barrel of 34 degree water and you're going to watch me go from a state of high stress, high anxiety, high panic in my body and I'm going to breathe myself from the inside out. I am going to calm my nervous system. And so if you have questions about anxiety, does it really work? Yes, it works. You see, when you are somebody that feels waves of anxiety, there are two things going on. Number one, when you feel a wave of anxiety, how many of you feel waves of anxiety or you have somebody that you love who feels waves of anxiety, right? A wave of anxiety is just your nervous system sounding an internal alarm. That's what a wave of anxiety is. Your nervous system believes that something around you requires you to pay close attention. When that wave of anxiety hits, there's a number of physiological things that happen in your body. Namely, um, <clears throat> all of the blood gets pulled from all over your body and goes to your major organs. Your thoughts start to hyper-focus. Your heart starts to race. Your stomach starts to get, um, you know, in knots. And um, that's all just a chemical and physiological response to the fact that your nervous system thinks that there's something going on that requires you to pay attention. Now, the problem <clears throat> for me when I was really struggling with anxiety is the second that I felt a wave of anxiety, so many of my thoughts would start to spin. And because my body was feeling this wave of anxiety, this fight or flight feeling, my thoughts would start to go, oh, fuck, oh, fuck, oh, fuck, oh, no, 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 I don't like this, I don't like this. And because my thoughts would start to spin, the wave would get more intense and the wave would start to crash more and more. And so there are two things that I'm going to teach you today. Number one, when a wave of anxiety hits, I want you to understand your body is just starting to go into a default mode. This is called your sympathetic nervous system. You have two nervous systems, your sympathetic and your parasympathetic. Sympathetic is fight or flight. It's the, oh my gosh, it's the wave. It's normal to feel waves of anxiety, everybody. It's normal to wake up and feel anxious. It's normal to feel a wave of anxiety after you've been drinking. It's normal to feel a wave of anxiety if you're walking to work and you hate your job. It's normal to feel a wave of anxiety if you're walking uh, into a restaurant and you're about to meet somebody that you don't feel really emotionally safe with. Your body and your nervous system is sounding an alarm. Pay attention. Doesn't mean danger, just means pay attention. Anxiety becomes a real problem and you're taught, you're hanging out with a woman who struggled with anxiety for 30 years. Anxiety becomes a problem when that wave, which is normal, sounding the alarm, pay attention, signals your mind to start racing, okay? And so, number one, I don't want you to freak out when you feel a wave of anxiety. Go, oh, don't say I am anxious or I have anxiety. Say, oh, I feel a wave of anxiety. When you label it as a wave of anxiety, you can now distance yourself from it and you can now manage riding the wave. Because what happens with all waves, everybody? They go up and then they come down. Everything that goes up eventually comes down. And so when I see those of you in the comments going, yep, every single day at work, Mel, I'm feeling a wave of anxiety. There's something up at that job that's making your nervous system go pay attention, pay attention. And so that's why you feel on edge. That's why you're like, ah. Now, the second thing you're going to learn today is you're going to learn that once you label, oh, I feel a wave of anxiety. Okay. I just want you to say label, I feel a wave of anxiety. The second thing we're going to do is we're going to control your thoughts and you can control your thoughts through your breathing. Okay. I'm going to teach you, you're going to breathe in for eight seconds and out of your nose. Okay. Now I'm going to invite you guys to please ask questions because I am about to climb into 
this ice barrel. I see questions about how am I able to deal with it without medication? Well, that was a process. I will make another video about that. Um, and everything, again, everybody that I'm about to show you, this is not medical advice. I am not a therapist. I'm not a licensed doctor. I am a uh, woman who struggled with anxiety for 30 years and using the five second rule to get control of my thoughts <clears throat> by interrupting them. YOLO. And um, by learning a lot about my nervous system and learning how to recognize a wave of anxiety and not let my mind freak me out when it happens, not escalating it with my thoughts. That was step number one. And step number two was using lots of different techniques to be able to recognize when I go from a state of feeling on edge and stressed out and fight or flight and feeling that wave to being able to breathe myself and soothe myself into a state of being calm, quiet, confident. You can see me putting my hand on my chest right here, the vagus nerve. This is uh, the on off switch between your uh, you're anxious and you're, I'm looking for something to show you. You're anxious and you're fight or flight um, and you're calm, cool. I write about this extensively, by the way, in the High Five Habit, which I've read for free on our YouTube channel. Just go to youtube.com slash Mel Robbins and you can find all of our videos. But today I'm gonna show you what I do with the cold plunge because you guys have had so many questions about it. And we're going to be doing a lot more content about this because I don't think it's possible to truly love and enjoy your life if you feel like at any moment anxiety is going to hijack you and ruin your life. And that was me for 30 years. Um, <clears throat> and I finally started taking control of my thoughts. And then I learned how to take control of my nervous system. Now, here is Chris. Uh, let me tell you what's making me nervous. Chris is actually in a vest and a hat. Is it that cold today? Well, I don't know how long we're going on here, but I'm going to be warm. <laughs> okay. So you guys can ask videos. Um, and uh, I'm about to go into a ice cold barrel. Now, first of all, does anybody have any questions about why cold exposure has been helpful for me for anxiety? And by the way, cold exposure can be taking a shower every morning and then finishing your shower by turning the water to uh, the cold setting and standing there for 15 seconds and then 30 seconds and then a minute. Cold exposure could mean climbing into uh, the ocean or a lake when it's really cold or a river where it's really cold. Cold exposure, guys, could mean pouring uh, your, your bathtub full of just cold water and then climbing in it. And the reason why I do cold exposure, uh, I was introduced it, it, it to it. It could also be without water. You could just sit in the snow. You could strip down and be standing out in very cold temperatures. And so why do you do this? Well, Chris and I got interested in this because we kept seeing the Wim Hof videos, the dude that's always sitting in the snow with the beard and the cool accent. So we took a workshop. Chris is a certified yoga instructor. He's a Buddhist meditation instructor. Um, he's a uh, soon to be death doula, hospice volunteer. This guy's Zen. Me, not so much. Um, I was really interested in it because I wanted to see, could I train myself to go from a state of panic into a state of calm? And could I sit in a safe situation, namely an ice cold barrel of water and breathe myself into a state of calm when the situation around me was freaking my body out. And so I, the answer is yes, you can. And it has helped immensely. And so I'm gonna give this to Chris because um, he's going to film me as I go out here. So we're gonna step outside everybody to, oh God, it's cold, to Vermont. Okay, welcome to Southern Vermont. Okay, so here's the barrel. So one of the things, oh my God, you filled this up, Chris? Chris put it to the top. Shit. Okay. So the thing is, is that there's like two, there's three actual benefits in terms of anxiety. So number one, every morning when I wake up, I know that I'm going to climb in this when I'm here in Vermont and I already dread it. How many of you have things that you dread in life that you think about it and you immediately feel that wave of, oh, I don't want to. 
So simply knowing that there's something that I'm going to force myself to do that I don't want to do and feeling that wave of resistance in my body and having the just willpower to push through it, the, the personal commitment that I'm going to do it, even though I don't want to, that's breakthrough number one. Because that same resistance of, oh, I don't want to, is what used to keep me in bed in the morning, feeling anxious and letting my thoughts spiral. So simply just saying to myself, I'm going to freaking do this, even though I don't want to. I'm going to finish my shower with a going cold, even though I don't want to. That's breakthrough number one. And these are skills that you can use everywhere, everybody. And if you get questions, Chris, just hammer me with them. Breakthrough number two is when you actually get dressed and now you're out here. My feet are freezing. Um, there's still snow on the ground. It's probably 40 degrees here. I'm standing here without a jacket on. My husband has on a hat and a vest. And pushing through and climbing in is breakthrough number two. Breakthrough number three, when it comes to taking control and healing my trauma and my dysregulated nervous system and learning that I can in any situation flip from a state of stress and anxiety into a state of, okay, I'm okay. Soothing myself. It's a superpower. And so what you're going to witness is you're going to witness me climbing in there. And the second I climb in, it's fucking freezing. And so you're going to see me tense up for real. And then I'm going to blow out the air and submerge down to here. And here's one more thing. A lot of you are asking, but I have Raynaud's, but my hands get cold. I have Raynaud's, which is a circulatory issue that's related to arthritis. I didn't want to try this because I was afraid that my hands would get even worse, that the numbness would get worse. It's actually getting better by safe cold exposure. So I'm going to climb in here. You're going to watch me breathe through this. And then, Chris, you can have them ask questions. And I'm going to stay in there for a minute, okay? You don't have to be a superhero. You don't have to do it for 10 minutes. Just simply knowing that you've made, A, the promise to do this and dreading it, that's breakthrough one. B, stepping into that shower or that tub or stepping outside, that's breakthrough two. Three, feeling the pressure and the wave of anxiety hits you and breathing through it, that's breakthrough number three. Every single one of those, you are building the muscle, everybody, of knowing that you can stand in discomfort, you can feel resistance, you can feel waves of anxiety, and you have it within you to get yourself through it. All right, here we go. Yes, I'm dreading this. This is really full. <laughs> Why did you have to fill this up? <laughs> <laughs> You're just going to press it all out. It's all good. I've never seen it this full, you guys. Like, I'm, my heart's racing. I do this all the time, and every time I go in, I know it's going to suck. That's one of the things about this. You never turn on the cold water in a shower. It feels good. Do we have a question? So one question is, you know, do you breathe through your nose or your mouth? Breathe through. I breathe through my nose. I would watch the videos, but I breathe through my nose, eight seconds, breathe out. But I breathe out of my mouth to get in. Okay, here we go. Because now I'm starting to feel a major wave of anxiety. Other people are anxious for you. I, I get, anxiety <laughs> spreads. Anxiety <laughs> spreads. Okay, you want to... Okay, here we go. Ah! Holy shit. Holy shit. Okay, I feel like... I think everybody is shocked. They have no questions for you at the moment. One question is, where'd you get the barrel? And you can see right here, okay. the brand is Ice Barrel. You can find it online.
Another question is, is it easier the longer you're in? No, no. Can't you get a cold from this? I don't know. I don't know if you can get a cold from it. What I'm, what I'm experiencing is my hands and my feet are tingling. My uh, skin feels super tingly, like pinpricks all over it. When in, when in chronic pain, how long do you do this for? I don't know. I think you need to talk to your doctor. I, my understanding is that the anything between two and five minutes is maximum required because after five minutes, the value sort of dissipates. I've actually never been in it longer than four. I typically stay about 90 seconds. What happens the longer you stay is that you're like, when I first got in you guys, there was this moment when I was in labor with our first daughter where the contractions were so scary and my heart was racing and my mind started to spin. And I thought, I can't do this, I can't do this, I can't do this, I can't do this. And uh, thankfully we could do this again. Is it hard to calm your breath? In the beginning it is, but as you noticed, I went from really labored breathing in and out of my nose to signal to my body that I'm okay and to shut my fucking mind off. How come you are not shivering? That's your breath controlling your body, right? I'm shivering in the water a little bit. But did you guys notice that like 30 seconds in, I went from like really labored breathing to being pretty calm? I mean, I'm not enjoying this, but I'm, my body's calm. I don't feel any anxiety. I feel discomfort. I mean, I freaking freezing in here and I'm starting to shake a little bit but I'm not I'm not feeling a wave of anxiety my heart's not racing my thoughts are basically at the mountain like look at that view you guys yes and so I'm shaking and I'm cold I'm really cold but I'm not scared and I'm not like I gotta get out of here I gotta get out of here I gotta even saying that made my heart race. Let me get back calm again. Been in for a while. Any more questions? I did, 90 seconds is plenty. 90 seconds is enough for me. Would you have a hot bath now? But I don't, I don't need a hot bath. Is it okay to do a cold shower before bedtime? Oh my gosh, you get a great night's sleep. It's the best before bed. I think a cold shower, honestly, everybody is harder than this because only having my head or my shoulders hit the cold water feels like my pins. Now my, I'm shaking. What do you do after? Why don't you show them what you do after when you climb out? Okay, here we go. Whoa! I feel like I, we need like a rail because yeah. I do feel shaky. Now, you kind of get the horse stance to get the blood back in here and then you wave your arms around to get the blood flowing because all the blood went to like my heart and my brain to try to keep me warm. And I'm getting the circulation going again. Activate. Now see how red my arms are? That's the blood coming back in. And you know, ironically, I'm kind of warm. Let's go inside, because, woo! <laughs> get a towel. Woo! Do you have any other questions? Other questions while well, I'm soaking wet. Other questions. How many minutes for a beginner? Um, I was, I would do, I tried to just do for a minute. Um, not in the shower. For the shower, I did 30 seconds. Um, the first time Chris and I did it though, you guys, we did it with a, a, like in a workshop. So they wanted us to go 90 seconds, but if you have a friend there supporting you, try to go for a minute. And I didn't bring my hands down for a long time, but now I put my hands down and I shove them in between my thighs, which are basically like meat mittens. I just give them work on there. There's a lot of questions about, can you have a heart attack? And if I had open heart surgery, can I you do this? You have to talk to your doctor, everybody. If you have any concern about your health or your 
um, heart or stroke or any kind of health condition, please talk to your doctor and please do this with somebody who's supervising you, who's been trained in cold exposure therapy, is just it, to be safe. Is it okay to do this daily like therapy? Um, yeah, like, like a meditation practice. I literally just did yoga and um, then I finished my exercise by going in there for 90 seconds. And I hate it every time, but every time I do it, I literally access this switch inside of me. Why is your skin red? I think my skin is red because when you feel waves of anxiety or you're in a really stressful or fight or flight or emergency situation, your body sounds an alarm, okay? And if your thoughts start to spin, your blood goes to your major organs to your brain so you can hyper focus and pay attention and to your heart so that you can run faster. And so when I get out, I believe that my arms are red because the blood is starting to come back and circulate through my body again. And so um, one of the reasons why this is important is because again, there are good reasons why you have anxiety and waves of anxiety. Um, when you feel a wave of anxiety before a test, for example, or before a big interview, and you get nervous and you feel that sort of hyper, that alarm go through your body, your heart races, your armpits sweat, and you're like focused on everything, it's because right before an interview or right before a test, your body's sounding alarm. Hey, this is important, pay attention. When I step into that ice cold water, which is literally about 34 degrees, the second you get into cold water, it could be life-threatening. So your body sounds an alarm. Hey, it's important, pay attention, do not stay in here long. And so the blood goes from your digestive tract and from your limbs to your heart and to your brain because it's trying to keep you alive. When I started to breathe, and as you watch the video, if you're just joining us now, if you go back, you'll watch me. I get in, I have a ha oh, like wave of anxiety because I'm in ice cold water. So my body sounds the alarm, get out, this is dangerous. I submerge and then I breathe myself into a state where I'm telling my body I'm okay. And by breathing in, I go about eight seconds in through my nose and eight seconds out through my nose. It also quiets the racing thoughts. When I climbed into that barrel, you guys, my mind was like, get out, get out, get out, get out. This is cold, this is cold, this is cold. Get out, get out, get out, get out, get out. It's sounding the alarm. As long as I'm focused on my breathing, my thoughts aren't racing. It's pretty amazing how this, ha how this is a technique you can use to take control. And I think even without the cold exposure, when your thoughts are racing, put your hands right here on your vagus nerve. This is an on off switch between your fight or flight nervous system and your parasympathetic nervous system, which is the calm, cool, grounded in your body nervous system. Put your hands right here and just breathe in eight seconds. And then I usually say three sentences. I'm okay, I'm safe, I'm loved. And if you just keep doing that over and over, breathing in and breathing out to interrupt the racing thoughts, pressing on the vagus nerve to signal to your body that you want your resting nervous system to flip back on. And if you say, I'm okay, I'm safe, I'm loved, in that moment, it's true. All right, I think that's it. Any other questions? How's the rain odes when you get out? Um, you know, normally when I grocery shop, my hands turn white. And my Raynaud's has gotten better because of this. I never would have believed it. I'm the kind of person that literally, guys, when I reach in and grab french fries out of the freezer at the supermarket and I pull it out, the finger, my fingertips are numb. When I uh, hike or ski, I, uh, my, my toes are white. I was just in 34 degree water and they're red, they're not white. It's Will you take amazing. a hot shower now? Probably just to rinse off quickly and get into the day. But it, there's no value or need necessarily, or that's not part of the practice? I don't know. I honestly don't know. I mean, you feel warm 
and you get this like adrenaline rush. You know, I mean, if you've ever jumped in cold water, I grew up on, you know, on Lake Michigan in, uh, in, in Western Michigan, and they used to cut a hole in the ice and do these polar plunges for charity. When you jump into cold water, your whole body's like, woo! And so you get this like adrenaline rush. And so I wouldn't need to, but I just kind of want to rinse it, rinse myself off, that's all. The, um, I think the last question that has come up a lot probably yeah. for people in warm climate climates is how do you prepare the ice? Well, what you could do is just run your bathtub to cold. And if you want to like make it really, really ice, just, just buy a bag of ice at the gas station and throw it in there. But honestly, just freaking tap water that's cold is cold enough. Um, and you'll be surprised and, and in your nose and out your nose. And final thing, I'm not a doctor. I'm not a therapist. I'm a woman on a mission to literally live an amazing life to stop feeling such sadness and negativity and um, heaviness in my mind and my body and to really experience more joy and ease. And I'm just sharing everything that's working for me, everything that I'm learning as I research, as I experiment with you in the hopes that I can save you some of the heartache and headache that I have caused myself because I didn't know any better. Before you label yourself as someone who has social anxiety, have you ever considered Maybe you're just bad at small talk and you hate being fake at big gatherings. Is it possible? <laughs> I mean, it does uh, make you stop and wonder. We've all had that feeling on a Friday night or late on a Saturday where you've made plans and then all of a sudden, as it gets closer and closer to you needing to get off the couch or to head home from whatever it was that you were doing and get dressed and get ready to go out again, you start to feel this heaviness and this dread in your body, right? You've had that feeling before. You're like, ugh, do I have to go to that birthday party? Ugh. Do I really want to go to that fundraiser or out to the bar tonight? Ugh, why did I say yes to this? Well, before you start to label yourself as somebody who has anxiety, social anxiety, right? I want you to stop and consider the difference between social anxiety and just actually not liking big parties. Seriously, I'm going to teach you the difference in this video. So if you're struggling with a form of social anxiety, all of that behavior that you feel, that, that, that dread that you feel, right? That heaviness that hits you right before you're about to go out. If it's social anxiety, all of that heaviness and that, that dread, it is literally triggered by the fear of doing it. You start to think about what's going to go wrong. You're scared that something is going to go wrong. You start to get nervous about what's going to happen, right? It's this feeling of intense dread. That's kind of the feeling of what it's like to have anxiety about social situations. And here's the irony of the thing. You may actually want to go to that birthday party. You may actually want to go to the concert. You may want to go out to the bar tonight to your friends, but you feel this dread kick in as you think about doing it. Okay. That's anxiety caused by social situations. The other thing that I mentioned is maybe you just hate small talk, right? Maybe you hate being fake. That's me. And that's not a feeling of dread. The avoidance that you're feeling, this resistance to going is due to dislike, not dread, dislike. Big difference between anxiety caused by social settings and simply being somebody like me. I hate small talk. I hate pretending that I'm interested when I'm not that interested. I hate big group settings. I'm really more of the kind of one-on-one, -on -one, small group, deeper, more intimate conversations kind of gal. And so before big parties, I just kind of get this like, ugh, do I really want to do this? Because I'm not the kind of person that likes what's required to go to a big networking event. So here's a surprising fact. You may feel the, the dread, the fear, the kind of anxious feelings that come with a big social situation, but you may still want to go. And that's how you also know that this is probably more in the lane of fear and dread and anxiety than it is just disliking small talk. You know, if you're thinking about like, I'm going to embarrass myself or what if this happens or what if that happens or what if I have to go to the bathroom or what if my face turns red or what if this or what if that or what if I see that person, that's more dread. 
That's more fear and that's more in the lane of anxiety. So the next time you're in a situation, I'm going to give you some questions in order for you to help yourself flush this out a little bit more, okay? Before you're like, oh, for sure, Mel Robbins, it's uh, fear, it's dread, it's, it's definitely a form of some sort of anxiety that I'm feeling. Just take a minute for a second and ask yourself this. Is the reluctance and the resistance that you feel, is it just a sign that you prefer to be home? Not because home feels safe, but because you just like being home by yourself better. That's number one. The next thing that you should ask yourself is, does the nervousness or the dread or the resistance that you feel just mean that you're the kind of person that likes deeper conversations? You prefer to be around two or three people. You're not the kind of person that loved being at fraternity parties when you were younger or loved the big social scene, that it just is sort of like, ugh, I could do without that. Like, I'm, I'm going to be uh, happier if I never do one of those things again. Or... Is the nervousness and resistance more because you're afraid something bad's going to happen? See, if it's something bad's going to happen, that's more in the lane of dread, right? If it's more in just like, mm, I just kind of have a preference here. It's not that I think something bad's going to happen. I just prefer something else, which is where the resistance come from. Here's another question that you can ask yourself. Are you nervous uh, because you're going to see people from your past or see people that you think judge you or because you're going to be put in a situation where uh, you feel like you're going to have to explain yourself. Now, it may surprise you to know that I'm somebody who feels all of these things. I just prefer to stay home. You know, I bitch all the time that I don't have a great social life, but the truth is I kind of prefer to stay home. I feel like I'm missing out when I see everybody at these big parties, but then I think, well, actually, I don't really have fun at those things. You know, I was just with my best friend from childhood this weekend on a business trip, we often meet up and see one another uh, while we're on the road working. And she said to me, she said, you know, Mel, a lot of people don't know this about you, but you're actually kind of a shy person. You know, I know that you have this big persona and you can get on a stage and you seem to be very outgoing and energized by talking to people. But the truth is the Mel Robbins that most people don't know, you're like a shy person. You kind of stick to yourself. You've had the same friends for a very long time. You're not somebody that's ever out and about and at lots of different parties. You kind of keep your circle tight. And so I'm telling you this because I think that oftentimes if you're extroverted in your work or extroverted in some aspects of your life, you put pressure on yourself to be extroverted everywhere. The truth is, even though I'm very extroverted in my work, I'm a homebody at heart. And, you know, my husband is very introverted. And um, that just means, by the way, if you're introverted, that you get your energy drained when you're around people. I tend to have my energy amplified when I'm working and I'm around people. But the second I'm done working, I just want to go home and sit on the couch, if you know what I mean. And so whenever Chris and I, Chris being the introvert, me being sort of extroverted, but I really, you know, kind of prefer small gatherings, Whenever we get invited anywhere, we're both so excited to pe see people that we like. But if it's a party that's bigger than like three or four couples, I always feel this resistance to going. And it's not because I'm nervous. And it's not because I think something's going to go wrong. And it's not because I'm running through scenarios in my head. That would be an indication of some anxious feeling about social gatherings. I just have this kind of weird resistance because I know I would prefer to be at a smaller gathering. That's it. It's a preference because I can't stand small talk and I can't stand pretending to be interested when I'm really not that interested. And so I prefer deep conversations with just a handful of people. And don't get me wrong. I mean, every once in a while, every one of us needs a massive blowout with a DJ and a dance party and an all out, just amazing time with a big group of people. But just the small talk thing, not my thing. So if you're sitting there going, hmm, you know, Mel, as you're talking about this and I'm thinking about what I feel as I'm pulling up to a big party, it's not a preference. It's really about dread. It's not that I favor smaller group. It's that I'm actually afraid of larger social situations. 
And typically what happens when you're dealing with anxiety that stems from a fear of social situations is the fear is triggered by this opinion that something bad's going to happen, that you're going to face some sort of rejection, that people are going to judge you. And if this is the case, you are dealing with something that you really should get some help with because you may actually want to join the crowd, but it's your nerves and it's your fear of rejection and judgment that keeps you from doing it. And so here are some like quick signs that this is you. Number one, you feel anxious because you think something embarrassing is going to happen. Or maybe in the past you had something embarrassing happen. And so it's sort of re you relive it over and over and over again in your mind as you're about to step into another situation that's similar. Uh, when you are at a party, you avoid talking to people that you don't know or have never met or don't know well. Another thing that you might find is that you start to fixate and worry about things that we all do, like uh, forgetting somebody's name or sneezing in the middle of a class or everybody suddenly turning and looking at you and you forgetting what you were going to say and then your face turning bright red. You know, maybe uh, you are worried because you're worried about going to the bathroom while you're at this big party because you have nerves about having to go to the bathroom in public. That's actually pretty common. Maybe you find that you're at these parties, but you're fidgeting and your leg is shaking or that you're constantly looking at your phone. You're constantly gripping your phone. Instead of being at the party, you are managing your fear about what's going to happen or something bad happening by burying yourself in your phone and texting people who aren't there. Or finally, you are fixated on the idea that everybody is thinking about you and that you assume that people don't like you. If these are starting to be like, God, that's me. Every time I do go to the bar, I'm assuming people are judging me. Wow, when I get invited to a birthday party, I have this weird feeling that they actually didn't want me there. This isn't you disliking something. This is dread and fear that falls into the zone of anxiety around social settings. So, you know, what do you do? Rule number one, understanding it is super important. So rule number one is you just got to name it. And I don't want you to say, I'm anxious. I have social anxiety. I want you to say, I'm feeling anxious whenever I'm in a social setting because you are not your thoughts and feelings. And when you name what you're feeling and you say, I'm feeling anxious whenever I step into a social setting, something really cool happens. And this is a, a study that was in the upward spiral. And what they found is that when you put your feelings into words, namely you start saying, I feel this nerves and this fear and this anxiousness in a social setting, rather than going, I'm anxious and labeling yourself. When you put your feelings into words, something really interesting happened. So the second, they did this study where they had people take a look at photographs of uh, folks that were having really emotional facial expressions. And what happens is if you look at a photograph of somebody who's like, ah, well, your amygdala in your brain immediately activated and read the emotions in the picture. But as soon as you're asked to name the emotion you're seeing, oh, I see anger the ventral lateral prefrontal cortex turns on and it reduces the emotional amygdala reactivity. In other words, by consciously recognizing and naming the emotions, this is so cool. When you name the emotion, I'm feeling afraid, nervous, or anxious about this thing. Naming it reduces the impact internally that you feel from that emotion. Pretty cool, huh? So number one, you are going to name what you're feeling instead of labeling yourself with it. Uh, the second thing that you can do is you can tap into cognitive behavioral therapy techniques, and that just involves making changes to the way that you think and feel about a situation. So what you're going to do is you're going to identify patterns of thinking that cause you to want to avoid social interaction. So for example, if you uh, tell yourself, nobody wanted me here anyway, and then you fixate on it, or you, another example might be that the last time you went to a party, uh, your dress ripped and it was really embarrassing. And now you think about it every time you go to a party. When you identify 
the pattern of thinking that makes you then feel bad, what you can do is you can then adopt more positive self-talk to encourage and coach yourself through that fear. The third thing that you can do, you're going to hate this, but it's called situational exposure. Just gradually reintroduce yourself to those situations that make you feel nervous, afraid, or anxious. And, you know, if you fear large groups, for example, just start by going out with a friend one-on-one -on -one, and then work your way up again to a smaller group of friends and so on. And by the way, therapists are super awesome in terms of helping you uh, with situational exposure experiments and uh, methods. Another thing that you can do is you can ask people for help. Just tell people what you're dealing with and ask somebody uh, to give you some extra support. Key to the support uh, in helping an anxious person become more independent over time is you not relying on them all the time. So for example, yeah, invite your friends to go with you to things, but you've also got to realize that you are going to need to start to come out of your shell. So for example, if you want to help a friend that is really anxious, invite them to do things. And when you're out at the bar or you are out at a networking event or you are out doing something fun, bring them into the conversation, ask them questions to help them come out of their shell. Another thing that you can do if you're socially, you know, you get nervous in those kind of situations is as you feel yourself getting nervous, just do the five senses technique where you feel the nerves or the fear or the anxiousness rising up. Take a deep breath and then ground yourself in the present moment. What do you see? Look around. I see the camera on this desktop computer. What do you smell? I can almost smell that it's cool right now. What do you hear? I hear kind of the buzzing of the light bulbs in this room that I'm shooting in. What do you feel? Oh, I feel my cat, Mr. Noodle, and his awesome fur. Um, what do you taste? Um, my mouth is kind of dry right now. I literally just brought myself into the present moment with you. And you do it by taking a deep breath and then noticing what all five senses are feeling. And finally, uh, you got to be kind to yourself as you're doing this. If you're trying to lower the nerves and the fear and the dread that comes with social settings, it's not going to go away overnight. It is going to take consistent effort on your part. Because the truth is, at this moment in your life, for whatever reason, any big social situation makes you feel a little nervous. That's okay. Happens to a lot of people, but you do want to attack this head on. Because the more you isolate and the more you avoid the things that you're afraid, the bigger the fear is going to get. And so, number one, analyze what situations trigger this. Number two, break it down. How can you think about it differently? How can you change the situation next time? Ask for a friend to support you. And remember that generally people are way more focused on themselves than they are focused on you. And they're not scrutinizing your behavior half as much as you think they are. In fact, they're probably not scrutinizing it at all. You're so busy in your head scrutinizing yourself. Everybody else is basically doing the same thing with themselves. And so I want you to understand that with consistent effort with a little bit of a commitment from you, with some help from some friends and perhaps even a therapist, step by step, you can name this fear, you can face this fear, and through the actions that you're taking, this dread will start to disappear and you may just start to love those big social things that you've been avoiding. You know, I struggled with anxiety for 25 years and I thought it was in the rearview mirror. I haven't had a panic attack, a bout of anxiety, anything really for about five years. And boy, I woke up this morning and there it was. And I think the fact that I woke up feeling so anxious, first of all, is really scary. Um, for me, anxiety would always come in the morning. 
and it feels like dread and then it immediately for me feels like I can't do this I can't do this and the this that I'm referring to is everything so I want to talk a little bit about what I'm doing to handle my anxiety and about the importance of emotional flexibility so as you can see I am up here in Vermont it's absolutely stunning no reason to feel anxious up here um, and that's another thing about anxiety is we make ourselves wrong when we feel anxious and I just did that so here's why I'm feeling anxious I came up here with my family because we've been quarantining outside of Boston for five weeks and thankfully everybody's safe and healthy and we came up to my husband's family's house up here in Vermont, um, a place that I love because we thought a change of scenery would be super helpful for our psyche. And we've been here for two nights and I woke up this morning and I felt so far away from my normal life that it scared the hell out of me. You know, I'm physically far away and it was a reminder of just how far away emotionally I feel from it and how much I actually am struggling, how I'm struggling to stay focused, how I'm struggling to work on my own, how I'm struggling to work remote, how I'm struggling to not be around so many people. And I think all of that came together and hit me this morning in the form of anxiety. Now, for me, anxiety is really suffocating causes me to panic. It makes me want to run. And so here's some things that I've been doing this morning to work through it. First of all, there's two ways I'm going to talk about emotional flexibility. One is, is being flexible with yourself so that when you feel something that's uncomfortable, that you're flexible enough to give yourself space to feel it because pushing it down, denying it, making yourself wrong it's only going to make that negative feeling grow. It's gonna make that anxiety eat you alive. And so I recognize that it was there. And what I do is I immediately say something. So my husband was next to me and I said something to Chris and he just listened. And he demonstrated emotional flexibility because he didn't make me wrong. He didn't try to fix it. He just let me have my reality, even though it's not what he's feeling. The next thing I did is I just got out a computer and I just started writing and writing and writing and writing and writing and dumping and dumping. And that helped a little bit. And so then I texted three friends. I texted um, Lisa and Gretchen and Mindy and said, I am really anxious right now and I'm struggling. And saying that and going back and forth on text with uh, them was a little helpful. And then I started to pace around the house because that's what anxiety makes me do. I start to feel like a caged animal. And Chris said, we should go for a hike. And honestly, the thought of climbing a mountain right now makes me want to die. <laughs> so I said, no, um, I didn't want to exert anything. I just know I need to move. And so instead I'm going to go walk down the valley and do this five mile loop that I really don't feel like doing, but I know I need to because I know that anxiety gets stored in my nervous system. It's triggered by my nervous system that everything right now feels far away from the life that I was living and the life that you were living. And that's why I'm so anxious right now. And so I'm going to move my body and move it out of my body. And then I am going to just practice having emotional flexibility and allowing the feelings to rise and fall and not do anything about it. So if you're experiencing anxiety for the first time, or if your normal anxiety has been jacked way up, or if it's coming back like it is for me, Please be patient with yourself. Take deep breaths, get outside and walk, 
and by all means be talking to your friends and family about what you're feeling because stored in here it'll eat you alive but when you start to speak about it and you start to move it through your body you will move it out of your body and you will feel better I know in an hour and a half when I'm done with this walk I will feel a hundred times better and I know if you pick up the phone and call somebody or you start journaling or you put on an exercise video and you move you will move this through your nervous system and you will feel back in control. I promise, I promise, I promise. I can't promise that it won't come back, but I can promise that you can make it disappear by taking those steps. Do you ever catch my anxiety when I get anxious? No. <laughs> I, I think least, you get at least annoyed. Not, at least not in the moment. It, How it, is it that you don't catch it? Because I catch our daughter Kendall's anxiety or our daughter Sawyer or our son's anxiety. But you seem to never, you seem to be able to insulate yourself from other people's anxiety. Well, I mean, it's a good question because I do sometimes find myself catching our kids' anxiety but I don't catch yours. And maybe that's just because of the amount of time that we've had together and the moments, frequent moments often, where I've, I've been the one sitting there with you and trying to extract your anxiety. Because that's really the technique that has always been so effective with you. Can you explain that, break down what you do. If I start getting anxious, like I did on Sunday, or I have throughout our 24-year marriage, what do you do? Because you have this superpower of being able to remain calm. And the thing that I find the most validating is, even though you don't feel anxious you are able to validate my reality of being anxious even though you're not in the same reality i i mean without giving it too much thought i think some of it has to do with the fact that first of all i'll i touch is huge right what do you mean so touch? meaning being able to hold your hand or being close and upfront and personal to what you're experiencing and just pulling what you're feeling out of your mouth like that that act of inviting you to describe what's going on to give detail to it and to almost not let up, to keep like pulling a thread, like what else is going on? What else is there? What else are you feeling? And I think maybe part of the reason why I don't get triggered by it in that moment is because I've seen it work so effectively that once you get it all out, it's like barfing, it's, it, it, it dissipates. So it's, it's almost as though the, the calming nature of the question set and extracting that from your brain or from your heart or wherever you're feeling it, I know, or I have a high degree of confidence that it will, it will calm down. It may not just extinguish itself, but it will, it will go away. So can we break this down for people? Cause I don't, I'm not very good at that. I didn't watch your video the other day, so I wondered what you did to actually calm yourself. I journaled. I talked to you. I then texted my three closest friends, Mindy and Lisa and Gretchen. Um, and then I went for a really long walk, which stimulates your parasympathetic nervous system and calms you down. But so that, So technique number one is to give somebody a hug or hold their hand, center them with physical touch. Yeah. Okay. Sit up close in front of them. Make sure that you have the eye con you know, as much eye contact as you can have physically with that person. Okay. I'm realizing that you do this consciously. 
It's, you it's, it's sneaky guy. It's been a few years. And then the <laughs> second thing you do is give people the questions that you might start asking the person in your life that's feeling anxious. Well, I would start with, tell me about your anxiety right now. What are you feeling? What's happening? Not only physically in your body, but of course, emotionally. I mean, those are the two main pillars. And then you keep going and anything else. And, and he does that over and until I'm literally like the tank is completely empty. You know what else I've noticed? And I think this is a really important thing is that you don't respond to what comes out of my mouth. No answers. You cannot provide any direction or guidance or um, go for the solve. Why? Because there is no solve, particularly when you're in the acute moment. There is no, nothing is going to resolve that right there and then, even if you have the most best, you know, idea ever. Which is super tough for guys in particular, I think, because we're so programmed to go for the solve rather than just be with it. Um, here's what I just realized at the biggest possible level about why what you do with me when I feel anxious is so genius. <laughs> well, anxiety is all about uncertainty and typically it's about what you're afraid of in the future that's coming that you can't control and by getting close to somebody physically even if it's over a video call and you lean in but you always sit very close to me or you give me a huge hug when I'm feeling anxious or you hold my hand you're grounding me with physical touch back in this moment and then the questions of extracting it get me to a point where I'm empty and no longer spinning and I'm right back in this moment when I have nothing left to say. And because you don't either try to discount or solve or invalidate anything that comes out of my mouth, you just get it out. I'm able to get it all out because the second you would say, well, you don't have to worry about that or this, that and the other, Somebody that's having anxiety will start to argue back, which then takes you back into the future fear. Yeah, then you're, then you're jumping into a conversation, which is the last thing that the person who's suffering the anxiety wants to be having. Since you've done this with me a hundred times, and we have kids <laughs> that have some anxiety, what is it that you've observed when you get somebody back to zero and in the moment. What do you observe in the person? I, I don't know, I've never really thought about that. I think what I observe is what you just said, which is people coming back to right now and how that is in and of itself is such a powerful grounding mechanism for because you're you're when you're right here you're you are out of you're you're out of your head you're not thinking about yesterday or tomorrow or wherever the source of that anxiety may be coming from mm. you're you're present to your physical space and surroundings and that i think has it must I, I know it. it has a profound effect on calming it, not necessarily extinguishing it, but certainly calming it. I think that's your superpower. I really do. Like, I, you are the most grounded, calm person in my life. And I wonder if it's the years of having a meditation practice and being a practicing Buddhist that has train that skill in you I think so I mean I've never I've never sat down to think about where it comes from necessarily but yes in Buddhist tradition or practices completely um, 
just being in observance and the act of deep listening, not just, you know, opening your ears, but really listening for what is being said is totally, you know, that's right up a Buddhist alley for sure. Is. Wow. Now I know why our kids like you more. <laughs> I'm more fun, but you're the one that grounds us all. <laughs> so um, you have a question that I think the entire planet can relate to right now. Yeah. Which is difficulty focusing. So why don't you tell me first a little bit about your situation and the details around it and what you're noticing about your ADD and ADHD, okay? Um, yeah, well... I was diagnosed at 28. And so I've been kind of working with my my own um, symptoms for years now. I'm 38 on Thursday, actually. Um, Happy and, birthday. Hey, Everybody give some thumbs up and some <laughs> to Angie. She's celebrating a birthday in quarantine. Here we go. Yeah. And your present is a coaching session with Mel Robbins. That's exactly what I was going to say. This is the best birthday present. Um, but then upon having kids, um, I have an almost six year old and an 18 month old um, kind of taking on those responsibilities on top of your own ADHD. And then all of a sudden we started seeing symptoms in our almost six year old uh, around three and a half of having ADHD. Like I would look at him and see, oh, my gosh, that was me when I was his age. Um, and it was just kind of building and we had reached out to some doctors over. Well, let me ask you a question real quick. Yeah. So first of all, you get diagnosed with uh, a ten ADHD when you're 28 years old. Mm -hmm. What did you feel when you got that diagnosis? Relief. Okay. And um, how does ADHD present itself for you? Because what most of you don't realize is that ADHD in women and girls is very different than ADHD in men and boys. And that women are profoundly underdiagnosed. I was not diagnosed with ADD until I was 45 years old. And it was liberating to find mm -hmm. out I wasn't crazy. I wasn't uh, <laughs> uh, losing my mind. It wasn't pre-menopause. It was an attention and focus issue. And one of the things I want everybody to understand is, first of all, we're going to have a general conversation about focus, because whether you clinically have a diagnosis of ADD or ADHD, everybody is having trouble focusing right now. Mm -hmm. Every time, Angie, I walk through our kitchen and one of our daughters are down there, they're 21 and 19. They're both taking classes online because their colleges obviously got shut down. Every one of them is complaining to their friends. I, I've been upstairs all day. I haven't been <laughs> done. Yeah. I'm sitting at my desk all day. I can't get any. I can't concentrate. I can't focus. Mm -hmm. I, what the hell am I doing all day? What is going on? And so the first yeah. thing I want to say to you, Angie, is that this is not a normal situation. Mm hmm and a normal response to an abnormal situation is to lose your focus and to feel anxious. Mm -hmm. And so what I wanna know is how is being in quarantine impacting your ability to focus? It's, it's as if it's just compounded and amplified with my husband working from home um, upstairs, having to um, figure out our schedules between, okay, who's going to do the schooling and who's going to be working at that time. Or if the, you know, the only little break we get to go one-on-one -on -one with our six-year-old is when the 18-month-old takes a nap. Okay. And so let me just get the facts straight. You got your husband who's working full-time. Mm -hmm. You've got a five-year-old that has mm -hmm. some issues with ADHD. You've mm -hmm. got an 18 month old. Mm -hmm. You have a home based business, mm -hmm. correct? Mm -hmm. And is there anybody else in the house? No. And our, I should add, our 18 month old is, uh, he's in the immunocompromised category because okay. he was born um, seven weeks premature. So he was in the NICU for a month. And actually, last September and October, he went to daycare like six times and had to be hospitalized twice with RSV and respiratory issues. Okay, so, so how is your 18 month old doing today? He's 
perfectly fine. He's okay. yes, he's on an inhaler twice a day, just as like protocol for his issues um, last fall. But it's also, you know, that's part of the the added fear for us is not only, you know, are we in this situation, but we do have one of the people who is an immunocompromised um, member, of our, member of our family. So we have okay. to keep the grandparents um, away sure. and yeah, and you know, all of that. So, so it just well, feels really compounding. Given that you are quarantined, your husband's got to work full time, you got a, a home-based business, you got two kids under five, one of whom has a compromised immune system. So you got to be hyper vigilant. Mm -hmm. Describe for me how this situation has triggered your inability to focus and heightened your anxiety. Well, yeah. And I, I really don't think I've had anxiety before um, now, really, I don't, really? yeah, I didn't really suffer. Like I was misdiagnosed with depression earlier on before I was properly diagnosed with ADHD, but, um, I didn't really have anxiety before now, but yeah, this is, I mean, it's a whole, it's a whole different level of, of all of the fears, you know, you're what are you afraid of describe them all for me. I'm start hearing the list. And if you can relate to this as you're watching me coach Angie, give us a thumbs up, or you can participate in this coaching by telling me in the comments, where are you afraid of? So describe kind of where your mind goes. What do you think about? What's the worst stuff you think about? What do you get anxious about, Angie? I think the thing I, I think of is we, we barely left the house, but my husband does have to go get groceries. And, um, and he, he actually suffers from anxiety. So he's actually wonderful about um, cleaning off all the groceries and making sure everything is clean before he brings it in the house. I mean, we, we've had a couple packages, um, things that we've had to order online that we've had shipped, we leave outside. So it's, it's that fear of something just by chance getting in and making him sick and, and not, uh, not being sure where, where it's, where it's coming from. And, and where do you feel the anxiety when your thoughts start to spiral? Where do you feel it in your body? In my chest. Yeah. Okay. I feel like, I feel like just this weight, like I can't, I can't breathe. And it's, yeah, it feel it just feels overwhelming. And what do you do when your chest starts to get really tight and your thoughts become very overwhelming? I just start talking. <laughs> um, I just talk. I just tell my husband how I'm feeling or I just say, I got to get this out because and anybody that knows me knows that's true. I just start, OK, what's I got to get this out or else it's going to crush me. And internalizing it has only, you know, proven to build the anxiety worse. So I've just always. I've, I've always been a talker, but like, this is, I got to get it out. I have to tell you how I feel just, even if I just have to say it so you can tell me that my fears are um, maybe a little out of whack or, Hey, this is what we're going to do to make sure that this doesn't happen. We're going to make sure that we have the groceries outside, right? You know, we're going to keep all the cardboard boxes outside, even, even what little risk that may be you know, we're going to, we're going to take all the precautions. I mean, I think my husband, he went to the grocery store yesterday and he's like, I'm getting everything for two weeks. And he was gone for like three and a half hours. Cause he was just being so careful, um, with everything. Um, and it's just, it's just that thing that you don't want to drop the ball and feel like you're safe for a second in, in the risk of something happening to him. And how exhausted are you? Oh, it's, it's completely exhausting. Like I feel, I, I mean, I do get a little, a little more sleep once we do all those things, you know, once I do talk it out, I feel like I'm able to actually sleep a little bit better, but yeah, it definitely, it, it pops up and I'll, you know, you just wake up and you think about, you know, the worst case scenario happening. Um, but I try oh, to right there. The anxiety is right there with you as well. When yeah. You wake up in the morning. Yeah. And it's in, I mean, most, if we're, if we're all home and no one goes anywhere and we're, it's fine. You know what I mean? It doesn't right. really present itself, but it's the, you know, walking outside and going on a walk and, you know, telling our five-year-old, like, you can't run over to, you know, that friend. Okay. And, okay so know. I want to handle this one thing at a time. So let's talk okay. about the anxiety first. Okay. Okay. 
So it would be weird if you weren't feeling anxiety right now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And the reason why I say that is because feeling anxious, feeling afraid, feeling overwhelmed in a moment like this is a normal response. Yeah. And so a lot of times what happens when you start feeling anxiety is the anxiety itself becomes so overwhelming that you start to resist it and you make it wrong and you start to fear the anxiety and resisting it makes it even worse. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so talking it out is one strategy, but the thing about that is your five-year-old will absorb that energy. Mm -hmm. from you. Yeah. And so your five-year-old will remember the specifics of this period of time, but your five-year-old will remember how it felt to be around mommy. Yeah. And so one of the things that I want you to do is I want you to use this as an opportunity to start to train your mind to not go there. Okay. Mm -hmm. Because your husband's already being hypervigilant. And what's happening is you're allowing your anxious thoughts to spin. And when you are talking them out, you're getting them out of your mind, but you are still giving them weight mm -hmm. by now spreading all of this anxiety to your husband. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so here's a strategy that I want you to use. Okay. I want you to start to use this as a chance to catch your mind when you start to go into hypervigilance, which is a form of anxiety that a lot of people are feeling right now. Your safety and your family's safety is the paramount importance here. Mm -hmm. And you can bet on the fact that your husband, if he goes out every two weeks, is going to be doing the grocery shopping and being vigilant. And you can stand there with your spray bottle and spray him down with <laughs> you know, your homemade sanitizer. But what you want to do is not allow your mind to go there. So there's two things I want. There, actually, I'm going to give you three thing, tools I want you to use. I know you already know the five second rule. Mm -hmm. So when your mind starts to drift to what are we going to do? What's your what's your 18 months old name? Otis. What happens if Otis gets us? What happens if Otis has to go into the hospital? What happens if there's something on the milk carton and then it touches me and then I touch him and then Otis gets sick and then I'll never forgive myself. And then we get there and there's no ventilator and then he's in the NICU and that is the moment that we got to stop down. So the moment you catch your thoughts going from one thought, did he wipe down the milk? That's how it begins. Mm -hmm. And it starts going to the next one because if he didn't, blah, 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 you're going to go five, four, three, two, one. Okay. And we're going to stop it down because we're not going to allow ourselves to get hysterical. Yeah. You are allowed to ask him, is everything cleaned off? Do you need me to wipe anything? Mm -hmm. You're allowed to do that. Yeah. But you're not allowed to have your mind go nuts. Okay. Yeah. Super important. So that's number one. Number two, when you start feeling yourself stepping up the anxiety. You are really cleaning everything like crazy, or you're feeling that chest pressure come on. When that steps up, I want you to step out of the room for a minute. Okay. I want you to take control by removing yourself from the thing you're hyper-focused on. Uh, like, is there something that you do when you get anxious? You clean, you mm -hmm. organize the clock. What do you do? Yeah, I clean. Okay. You organize, do laundry, something. Okay. Yeah. When you catch yourself doing anxiety chores, I want you to step away. I want you to step out and I want you to five, four, three, two, one. I'm not going to allow myself to get worked up about this. Here's the final thing that I think will help a lot. Um, telling yourself that nothing bad is going to happen does not work. Exactly. And the yeah. reason why it doesn't work is because when you say nothing bad is going to happen, it invalidates your fear. Mm -hmm. The best way to disappear fear that is supported by facts, because we all do need to protect uh, our family's safety and we all do need to be vigilant in terms mm -hmm. of washing hands and cleaning yeah. stuff when we get it from the grocery store. So the fear is valid, but I don't want the fear to hijack you. So what you're going to say is when you feel the chest tightening, five, four, three, two, one, you're going to say, if something happens, we'll deal with it then. Yeah. Today, we're all safe. So can you say that with me? If something yeah. happens, here if we go. Something if something happens, happens. Something happens. 
We'll deal with it then. We will, we will deal with it when it comes and we will all be safe. Yes. And what does saying that do for you? Um, it, it just gives me the control back, which I think is like, I mean, like everybody feels like this is all out of our control. So it, if, if I'm saying that, then I take it back and then the anxiety won't, won't control me. Yes. Because as weird as it sounds, anxiety is a coping mechanism because when you can't control all the craziness that's going on out there, you start to feel anxiety and you start to get nervous and your thoughts start to spiral and whatever it is that you do, talking it out or folding laundry or focusing on your chest tightening, mm -hmm. all of that worrying distracts you from the thing you can't control and then it makes you focus on anxiety and getting control of anxiety. And so we don't want anxiety to be the thing that's controlling you. Using that mantra, hey, if something happens, we'll deal with it then and we will all be safe. And today, everybody is great. Mm -hmm. Today, we're doing our part. And the today part's really important because it brings you back into the present. Anxiety is trying to hijack you and pull you into a scary future. Mm -hmm. Hey, you know, if something happens, we'll deal with it then. Today, we're all safe and there's nothing that I need to concern myself with, okay? So when you first start using the five second rule, most people use it to get to the gym, to make sales calls, to get up on time, to have tough conversations, to do the physical stuff. Yeah. But the real mojo is to use it to rewire your mindset. Okay. And so if you're somebody that suffers from anxiety, first of all, here's what you need to know. It's not a disease, period. It's not a disease. There are people that suffer from acute anxiety disorder. They should seek professional help. There's incredible medication that works. I'm talking to the people that suffer from more general anxiety that people feel in their day-to-day -day lives right. or that are brought on by a specific situation. I'm also speaking from um, specific personal experience and the fact that we know of hundreds of thousands of people who've actually cured their anxiety right. because of what I teach. So here's what you need to understand. Anxiety always begins with a worry, always. It begins with a thought that is triggered by something. So if you suffer from anxiety, you wake up in the morning and your mind spins, you lay in bed at night and your mind spins, you walk into work and you feel anxious in your body. I want you to write down all the things that trigger you to feel anxious. Interestingly, another major trigger <clears throat> is being home or going home and that moment right before your partner walks in the door. If you feel anxious when your partner's about to walk in or you're about to walk into your own home, that is a major signal that you're in the wrong relationship, that there is something incredibly off and you either need to get into counseling, but that is one that we hear a lot about. Wow. Um, because you're walking into a situation mm. that feels uncertain. Yeah. A lot of people, by the way, had parents that were abusive or parents that were yellers. So they also are experiencing ghosts from the childhood yeah. of it's five o'clock, dad's about to come home and pour a drink and everybody's on edge. Yeah. So write down the triggers, okay? Because having, tr having kind of the triggers ahead of time will help you come up with a plan for how you're going to catch yourself when your mind defaults to the automatic ways that it thinks. Then what I want you to write down next to the trigger is what exactly are you worried about? So having the trigger and then the, what do I worry about? I worry that my boss is gonna yell. I worry that my partner's gonna yell. I worry that I'm gonna get in trouble. I worry that um, you know my friends are gonna laugh at me. I worry that I'm gonna be a, whatever the fuck it may be. Then what you're gonna do is you're gonna write down what I call an anchor thought. An anchor thought is something that weighs you down and it makes you excited. And so here's how the strategy works with the five second rule. The next time you're in a situation, and let's just use the example of pulling into your own driveway or your own apartment, and maybe you've got issues with your boyfriend or girlfriend or your roommate, and that makes you unsettled. You're, the second you pull in and you feel the trigger, you're gonna go five, four, three, two, one because I want to interrupt your mind from going into the fuck, fuck, fuck. I don't like, what, what if I do this? And then you're going to drop in the anchor thought of the last time that you and your roommate really got along well, 
or the last time that you stood up for yourself and it went fine. And or your gonna, puppy. Yeah, or a puppy or whatever. <laughs> and you're going to say, I'm so excited to deal with this. Yeah. And then you're going to get out of your car, even though your body is going to feel a little unsettled and your mind's going to race. Go five, four, three, two, one. If you start to like be like, uh, but what? Uh, uh, and then walk in the door. And what I'm teaching you to do is to not let your mind hijack you. Right. And it's very important because there's a very tight nexus between your habit of worrying and spiraling your thoughts and the way your body starts to amp up. And so we want to settle your mind so we don't agitate your body. You got it? Yeah. And so if you start to practice that over and over and over and over and over and over and over again, and for you 18-year-olds that are watching this, use this with the nerves that you have about what you're going to do with your life. Use this when you catch yourself worrying about college applications because worrying about the applications won't get them done. Worrying about what your friends are doing won't make it happen. Worrying about what you're going to be doing when you're 25 or how you're going to make money, it's not going to help you make money right now. It's only going to make you miserable. Right. So five, four, three, two, one, cut off that habit. Yeah. That'll stabilize your body and then go to a vision of you at the age of 25 driving a car that you think is cool and hanging out with a friend that's cool and saying to yourself, I'm so excited because I know I'm going to figure it out. Because you don't need to worry about that shit right now. Yeah. But it becomes a habit that destroys your year this year. So you have a choice over what you think about. Yeah. We all do. Well, I'm going to prove to you folks today that the secret to everything the secret to believing in yourself when you don't know how to believe in yourself. It's just five seconds. I'm gonna to prove to you that there's a five second window that nobody talks about and I'm so thrilled I get to share it with you because once you see it, you'll never unsee it. And this is the only thing that is holding you back from getting everything you've ever wanted. And that is that there is a five second window that defines your life. There's a five second window, I'm gonna prove it to you today between a moment when you feel confident and your self-doubt talking you out of it. A moment when you feel inspired to share what you're up to, to give somebody a sample, and fear stopping you. There's a five-second window between feeling motivated and your excuses stopping you. And there is a five-second window between feeling courageous, feeling like, okay, I don't care what anybody thinks, I'm going to go talk to that person over there, and boom, five seconds later, fear has stopped you. And we're going to talk about this word courage, because you're going to need it. And I don't know about you, but when I hear the word courage, you know what I think about? I think about the big stuff. I think about life or death. I think about my heroes. But I want you to consider something. To reach your God-given potential, to tap into the magic and joy and all the opportunity and success that you deserve and that your family deserves, it's going to require courage. Because courage, by definition, is just the ability to do something that feels scary or difficult or new or uncertain. That's what courage is. It's the little things. And it's the little five-second changes. I'm going to prove to you today. It's the secret to this business. It's the secret to your marriage. It's the secret to everything. And in order to tell you the story of my secret weapon, I call it the five-second rule, not the one we grew up with. You know, if you drop food on the floor, you pick it up, and you blow the dog hair off, you're good to go. Um, this, is a, this is something I created during probably the worst moment of my life. And in order to tell you the story about it and how you're going to use it, I got to take you back 10 years to a moment in my life where, my God, every time the, the alarm went off, this is what I felt like doing to it. You ever feel like that? The alarm goes off, you're like, yeah, not today. Not today. I do not want to do this today. And, you know, the interesting thing is that you can know what you need to do. How many of you know what you need to do to grow this business? Yeah, is that going to make you do it? Of course not. How many of you know what you need to do to be healthier? Is that going to make you do it? I don't think so. You got to know how. How do you make yourself do the stuff after you've worked a full-time job and you've come home and you're tired and you got four kids to take care of and you got to be a wife or a husband and you got a million other things to deal with? How do you make yourself do the stuff when you don't feel like it? And here's another truth, everybody. There's always going to be an excuse not to. Always an excuse not to make that call. Always an excuse not to send that email. Always an excuse not to walk up to that person and tell them all about total life changes. 
always, always, always. And I had every excuse in the book. You see, 10 years ago, I had lost my job. I was unemployed. My husband had opened a pizza restaurant with our life savings, and that puppy was going under. We were about to lose <clears throat> our home. We had already lost our life savings. The liens had hit the house. The bankruptcy proceeding was a week away. And the financial stress, my God, it was, it was taking us down the drain with it, along with our marriage, our sanity, our sobriety. This was 2008. Anybody else have a lousy year that year? You know, and we're not the only ones. It's not the world's craziest story. A lot of people in this room have faced those issues. But here's the thing. Isn't it easy to look at someone else's life and be like, oh, this is what you need to do? But when the change is happening to you, as personal, right? When the change is required of you, it's personal. And it's so much easier to do this. Oh, I, I, I don't deserve this, and this isn't fair, and this shouldn't be happening to me. And have you ever noticed that whenever you do that, you blame and you complain and you point the fingers and you come up with all these things? You ever noticed that there's always three fingers pointing right back at you? It's so irritating. It's a reminder that the power is in you. Now, I knew what to do. I knew I should get up. I knew I should look for a job. I knew I shouldn't be nice to be my husband. I knew I shouldn't drink so much. I knew I shouldn't isolate myself. But that didn't make me do any of this stuff. I was so stuck. And you know, if I hadn't discovered what I'm about to share with you folks, I know that our marriage wouldn't have made it. I know that we would have lost everything, our, our family, our home. I, I have no idea what I'd be doing for a living. I'm certain I'd be an alcoholic. But thank God one night everything changed. Now, it's a really stupid story, so brace yourself. OK, you ready? Yeah, here's what happened. So um, I was sitting in our living room. And have you ever been so desperate that you give yourself a pep talk? You know, and you're like, OK. That's it. Tomorrow morning, it's the new you. You're going to get up and go to the gym. You're going to be nice to people. You're not going to drink so much. You're going to look for a job. And by God, Mel Robbins, when that alarm clock rings, you're not hitting the snooze button and lying there and thinking about your problems. You, my friend, are going to get out of bed. And then all of a sudden, I saw this blast across the television screen. And I thought, oh, that's the answer. That's the answer to getting up on time. Tomorrow morning when that alarm goes off, instead of lying in bed and having anxiety and overwhelm and thinking about all my problems and hitting the snooze button, avoiding my life, I'm going to launch myself out of bed like a rocket ship. I'm going to move so fast that I beat anxiety. I beat every excuse in the book. Now look, it could have been the four Manhattans I had had that gave me that idea, because I was drinking an awful lot back then. It sounds kind of stupid, doesn't it? But for whatever reason, I'll never forget it. It was a Tuesday in February, 10 years ago. That alarm clock went off. That's what happened. I immediately remembered that dumb countdown idea, the idea of launching myself out of bed. And then this five-second window of hesitation that I'm going to reveal to you opened up. And I started thinking about getting up. And I started thinking about all the reasons why I didn't want to. And I started thinking about, oh, it's not going to work. And I don't feel like it. It's really cold. And I started reaching for the snooze button. And then I did something I had never done before. I started counting backwards, just like NASA does. To launch a rocket, I went five, four, three, two, one. And all of a sudden, for the first time in six months, I was up. I was like, five, four, three, two. That is the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my life. And I went on with my day. The next morning, the alarm went off. That's what happened. I immediately remembered that countdown thing. And then I started thinking about what I needed to do. And all the excuses started to roll in. And I could feel myself hit the snooze button. Five, four, three, two, one. And I'm up again. Weird. The third morning. The alarm went off. That's what happened. I immediately remembered the countdown thing, and I could feel all the anxiety and overwhelm and frustration coming in, and this isn't going to work, and I don't care, and I don't want you, and then 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, I'm up again. Now, by that point, I was kind of weirded out. I was like, um, do I come from like a line of witches or something? I mean, is this like a spell? I thought, OK, uh, let's test this little spell, and let's see if I can try this countdown thing in other situations where I don't feel like it, where I'm afraid where my emotions take over. And so I walk into the kitchen, and my husband, Chris, is standing there staring in the fridge. And you know how that thing happens, where you see somebody you love and you want to kill them? You know? <laughs> so my poor husband, Chris, is standing there you know, looking for breakfast. And I walk in, and I see him, and I'm like, <laughs> And you know, here's the thing. I didn't 
want to kill him. I loved him. I was just so scared. And I didn't think we were going to get out of this mess. And isn't it true that it's so much easier to be angry than it is to be in action? It's so much easier to complain about the problems than to focus on building a solution. I'm not proud of the fact that I was triggered all the time, that I was nasty to him. And that's a nice word for it. But I went five, four, three, two, one, and something crazy happened. Like my body settled, and I was able to speak to the guy from a place of my values instead of snapping at him. I see the phone. It would obviously help if I call and I start looking for a job, but I don't know about you folks. I hate cold calling. I hate network. Five, four, three, two, one, I'm picking up the phone. Five, four, three, two, one, I'm picking up the phone. Five, four, three, two, one. And I'm cold calling my way into interviews and, and, and trying to land a job. And then I see my sneakers, and I don't know about you folks, but I don't like to exercise. Five, four, three, two, one, and I'm out the door. And slowly but surely, my my whole life changed because I had this tool to push myself through the excuses that were stopping me and robbing me of my potential. Chris took it into the restaurant business. Five, four, three, two, one. They're trying to renegotiate a lease with the landlord. Five, four, three, two, one. They're going out and meeting with people with money and telling them the truth about what's going on. And five, four, three, two, one. Slowly, one decision at a time, they pulled that restaurant business out of the wreckage. Now, I never intended to tell anybody about this. Because first of all, it sounds stupid. Oh, you, you want to change your life? Count to five. Speech is over. I'm out, guys. See you later. <laughs> the other thing is, I had no idea why it worked. I mean, why would something so simple work? Why would it work to help you get in shape? Why would it work you to help change your business? Why would it work to help you land a job? Why would it work to help you not snap at your kids? Why would it work to help you calm your nerves? I had no idea. Well, that all changed. About seven years ago, uh, somebody asked me if I would come and give a talk about career change. Now, by this point, I had been using the five-second rule for three years. I had changed my whole life using it. My marriage was back on track. I, I had the drinking under control. I would cold-called my way into a radio audition. I had a little Saturday morning show. That show took off and became syndicated. Next thing you know, I've won a big award. CNN is calling, and now I'm on TV as a legal analyst. Like, I can't believe this. Chris is open in a second restaurant. Our kids are doing OK. And so somebody says, hey, would you ever come give a talk, Mel, about career change? This was not a talk, by the way, about this five-second thing. So um, this is the first time that I had ever given a speech in my entire life. If you would like to know what it looks like to have a 21-minute long panic attack, I invite you to watch this thing. <laughs> We're about a minute in here, ladies and gentlemen. And you notice I'm already getting that rash that you get on your neck when you start to get nervous. By minute 19, I have a full-blown panic attack on stage. Like, I completely forget where I am and what I'm supposed to say. And I look at the crowd of people and I go, mm -hmm. <gasps> oh, I know. There's this thing I do. I call it the five-second rule. You got to move within five seconds or your brain will kill it. Thank you. And I leave. And my husband's backstage, and I say, Chris, that's like the most embarrassing thing that's ever happened to me. Dear God, do not let me give a speech again. And then something crazy happened. A year later, somebody put this talk online. It now has 17 million views. That's not the crazy part. You want to hear the crazy part? The crazy part is people started to write to me. And by people, I mean strangers. And by strangers, I mean a quarter of a million of them from 91 countries, and those are just the people who emailed. And you know what they said? They all said, holy cow, Mel, I started using this five-second thingy, and I'm on pace to double my business, and I'm able to be present with my kids. And my word, I started using this five-second thingy, and I've got the courage to reach out to people that I admire, and wow, they're responding. Whoa, I brought this back to my sales team at work, and we're number one in the region. Crystal's team, number one in the country last year. Why? You're not selling anything if you're thinking about selling it. Five, four, three, two, one, that's right, interrupts your habit of thinking about it and creates a habit of doing it, okay? Should you take it back to your teams and your friends? Of course you should. Should you teach it to your children? Five, four, three, two, one. Yes, but proceed with caution because they will use it on you, you know what I'm saying? Five, four, three, two, one. Mom, lower your tone. Five, four, three, two, one. Dad, you said you were going to the gym. 
Now, one of the things that has blown my mind is that it's being used particularly in combination with other therapies, everybody, to help people manage addiction. We hear from somebody, we reach a million people online every single day on our social media platforms, and I hope to God that you follow us so we can stay in touch. And you should tape this and photograph this and use everything I'm saying to your advantage, so please, Keep your phones out and do what you need to get what you need. You understand? You'd be selfish about our time together. And, you know, the thing that's really blown my mind, though, you know, people write to us every day. We hear from at least one person a day that says, when I think about sobriety as a five-second decision that I make all day long, somehow shrinking it makes it feel more manageable. But I'll tell you, I never thought that something so simple would actually save lives. As of last week, we know of 76 people who have not committed suicide because they've used the five-second rule to stop themselves. It's incredible. Incredible. This guy right here, everybody, his name is Steve Montgomery. And Steve is a veteran. And like way too many of our veterans, he has PTSD. And he wrote to us about this very moment. You see, he boarded a ferry overseas with the intention of ending it all, jumping overboard. And look, I don't know where you are in your life. I don't know if you're at the most amazing moment and you feel just fabulous, or if you're feeling pretty low. But I do know one thing. There is wisdom inside you. It's like an alarm that goes off all day long. It's the power that is in you. It is talking to you all the time. It is pushing you forward. It is calling for your greatness. And it doesn't leave you. It's a matter of whether or not you have the clarity to hear it and the courage to listen to it. So Steve's about to jump, and that alarm, that power, that power that will help you make your dreams come true, that will change your life, that will allow you to believe in yourself when you start to think that you don't believe in yourself, it speaks to him, and it says, you know, this is not the answer. Now, he knows the five-second rule. So he starts counting backwards, five, four, three, two, one. And here's what I'm going to teach all of you. There's actually science behind this. It's amazing. What happens when you count backwards, five, four, three, two, one, is you interrupt what we call habit loops. It's patterns, patterns of thinking, patterns of behavior that don't serve you. You interrupt those, five, four, three, two, one. And by the time you get to one, you've drawn your focus to your prefrontal cortex. Now, that's a big word. Here's what it means. Your prefrontal cortex, that's the part of your mind that you're using when you're in control of what you're thinking about, when you're acting with courage, when you're selling. Basically, the five-second rule is a cheat code that allows you to turn off the part of the brain that is sabotaging your success, that is doubting you and to activate the part of your brain that gives you control to everything. Now, if you wanted the license plate, it's already gone in Arizona, and I have a couple disclaimers. The five-second rule is a tool you're going to use to push yourself out of your comfort zone, to push yourself through your excuses. You're going to use it to make micro changes. You're going to use yourself to push forward. This is not to be used to sign a contract, okay? This is not to be used to get married. This is not to be used to make a gambling bet. And please, if you plan on putting this permanently on your body, think longer than five seconds before you slap something like that on your wrist. You know, you might consider a bracelet before you put something hideous on your leg. You know, that this just was three days ago we got this photo. And you know, of all the photos we've received, and we've received thousands, thousands of tattoos, this is my favorite. And the reason why is this is your life. This is my life. You see, if you stop and think about it, the world's changing all the time, right underneath your feet, right before your eyes. And you can't control that. Neither can I. It's this infinite loop of amazing things that are happening to and around you. And some of it's going to be fabulous and mind-blowing and spectacular, and some of it's going to be heartbreaking and devastating. And none of us can change that fact. But when you understand a simple idea, that you just stop worrying about all that stuff that's going on around you, and you focus on your five-second window of what you choose to think and do in response, and you control absolutely everything. 
And one of the coolest things about the five second rule, and I'm gonna show you how to use it to build your business, to cure yourself of anxiety, to do all kinds of amazing things. But when you start to play around with this five second window and you realize, hey, you don't necessarily choose the stuff that's gonna to happen to you in your life, but you can always choose how you respond to it, you will never be knocked off your values. No matter what happens, just ask Kyle. So let's go back to you being selfish, okay? I want you to hold on to this idea of what do, you want, what do you want in your life? What are your dreams for you? And then I want you to bring it back to yourself. Think about that excuse, that excuse that is stopping you, the one that you always reach for, like I was reaching for the snooze alarm. And I want you to think to yourself, what do you need to change? And it could be something good. Like I have this huge thing going on in my life right now. I have a brand new, you guys, I landed a daytime syndicated talk show. No kidding. September 16th, I hope you'll tune in five days a week. Watch out, Dr. Phil, because the Mel Robbins Show is going to be airing nationwide. That's right. And when I think about all the changes I've made in the last 10 years, my God, I'm exhausted. And when I think about what it's going to take for me to be successful in this next stage of my life, Right? That's right. I hear you. And to do 175 shows a year. And to be a lifeline for people every day. And what it's going to take for me and my habits. I got a lot I need to change. I need to be more deliberate about a lot of things. I got to be more present with my family when I'm around them. I got to make sure that I stay centered. And so I want you to think about, when you think about that next chapter that can start right now, what is it that you need to change for the good? That small little tweak, and I want you to hold on to that because this is an easy question to answer. The real one is this one. The most important word in that sentence is will. Not will you or won't you change, but do you have the will to push yourself to change. When you're tired, when you're frustrated, when somebody said something just nasty or racist or sexist to you and it brought you down, do you have the will to keep pushing forward? And the answer is, yep, you will, because you're gonna have this puppy in your back pocket, okay? So let me explain how you use it. The next time you're in a situation where that alarm goes off, you kind of know what to do. You feel that little bit of confidence. You feel that hope. You feel that courage coming up. And then you feel that five second window of hesitation open up and those excuses roll in and you start to feel yourself shrinking. You start to feel yourself getting silent. You start to feel yourself backing away from that thing you know you need to do. You're going to pull out the five second rule and go five, four, three, two, one and step forward. Now, a couple things about that. If you are with a group of people, do not count out loud because you will sound like a weirdo. I do not want you in a meeting going, five, four, three, two, one. You're like, oh my God, what is happening over there? A couple other things, don't count up. One, two, three, four, five, it doesn't work. The reason why one, two, three, four, five doesn't work is because you and I were taught to count up in whatever language we were to, taught to count it in since we were yay high. It's already a pattern that is stored right here that you can do on autopilot. You can do it without thinking. I want you to develop a new pattern when you go five, four, three, two, one, and you activate this puppy right here. Let me show you what's actually happening in your brain when you use forms of metacognition. Now, metacognition is just a fancy word that means brain trick. That's all. You have the ability to outsmart your own mind. You have the ability to use simple tricks to be able to control which part of the brain that you're using. So this guy right here is a simulation of a functional MRI when people are using forms of metacognition. That red part right there, it's the interior part of your brain. It's where all your habits are. It's where your emotions are stored. It's where every pattern that you know from driving a car to doubting yourself, to feeling anxious, to worrying about what other people think, those patterns that are sabotaging you right there in the red part. The green part, that's your prefrontal cortex. That's gonna make you more money. That's gonna make you happier. That's gonna allow you to develop new skills. That's what you're using when you're in control of what you're doing. So let's count out loud backwards together and let's see what happens when you use this. Here we go. Five, 
four, three, two, one. Excellent. For those of you that felt pressure right there, don't worry, I'm not a hypnotist. That's just evidence, and you're going to feel that from time to time, that you're actually shifting gears in terms of which part of the mind that you're using. You know, when you first start using this, I think it's really obvious how you use it. You use it to do very irritating things, okay? You're going to five, four, three, two, one, push yourself to the gym. Five, four, three, two, one, push yourself to talk about total life changes. Five, four, three, two, one, push yourself to put down the drink. Five, four, three, two, one, push yourself to lower your voice. And look, you're probably going to hate me at times. I'm cool with that if you're changing your life for the better. I don't mind if you hate me. And I want to say something else about changing your life for the better. Do you realize I have been using the five second rule for 10 years? I use it every single morning to get out of bed. I hate getting out of bed. I use it every day to exercise. I hate exercising. I want you to understand something. There are going to be things that you need to do to heal your family, to build your business, to make more money that you may never like. That's OK. You can still do it. So I don't want you to expect that you're ever going to love having to make a cold call. You may always hate it, but you can still do it. I think about it like loading the dishwasher. I hate doing that too, but I still do it. Now I want to show you, given that I think the physical stuff is obvious, I want to show you two really important things. First of all, I'm going to show you a bunch of five-second habits. These are habits that I have that I do every single morning and every single night. And it is the reason why I am so successful. And it is the reason why I can focus on what's important most of the time and not get caught up in the baloney, OK? And so most of you are going to hate these. I want you to try them anyway. And so these are my five second habits that I want you all to adopt. And I promise you, if you adopt these, play around with them, you will make more money. You will make more money in less time. You will feel less anxiety. You will be less distracted. And I promise you, you're going to hate every one of them. You ready? Here we go. So the first one is about your phone. I want to put something into perspective for you. We live in what I call the attention economy, OK? That means your attention is for sale. Whenever you're on Facebook, whenever you're on social media, and you're just kind of wasting time scrolling, if you click on something, you just made somebody money. They just bought your attention. And so one of the things I want to shift your perspective about is it's become more important than ever that you realize that your phone is perhaps the most important tool in your business, right? You got that? For those of you that don't have enough time, the reason why you don't has to do with how much time you waste on this. And so, yeah, I know. Mm, I don't like what she's talking about. I don't like this at all. It's true. If you want to, I want you to wake up and realize how often you're really using this to further your business and your goals or when you're the one that's making other people money because you're spending all your time clicking on a bunch of crap that doesn't matter, all right? So one of the number one rules that I have that I want you to adopt, and it takes five seconds, I don't want you to ever have your phone in your bedroom. What? What? How dare you? Excuse me? I do not want your phone in your bedroom. And there's a couple reasons why. Number one, you're addicted to it, OK? Number two, this is sickening. You ready? 33% of you are checking email in the middle of the night. Look, I'm 50 years old. I get up at 2.13 every morning, you know, and I got to go to the bathroom, and it's nice to have a flashlight. But if you got it, then you're going to look at it. This is sick. And most of you don't even realize that you're doing it. And then you wonder, I don't I'm getting I can't sleep. I can't sleep. Nah, 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 nah. <laughs> you want to know the other thing that's sick? 87% of you check it before you brush your teeth. 
You want to know why you wake up anxious and out of control and you got no time and you're freaked out? It's because you look at this thing before you even get out of bed. I mean, think about it. You're like sleeping. If it's next to you and the alarm goes off, what are you going to do? Oh my God. That's what's going on today in the news? Oh my God, what's happened? That person's on vacation again? I hate them. And you wake up and you're like totally freaked out and upset and oh, now you don't know why you don't know why. And that's why your day starts. Is it any wonder if that's how your day starts, why you don't have time? Why your mind is already out of your control? You have to put this out of your bedroom, and here's why. I don't trust you, and you shouldn't trust you either with it. <laughs> now, here's the second rule. So it's not in your bedroom, so the alarm goes off. I don't want you to hit the snooze button. Now, here's why. The reason why has to do with the way your brain works. Your productivity and your focus has nothing to do with when you get up. It has everything to do with how you get up. So if you, you and I, we sleep in sleep cycles. So you fall asleep, it takes you know, a little while, and then you drift into a sleep cycle, and a sleep cycle is about 75 to 90 minutes. And then you do another one, 75 to 90 minutes. And then you do another one, 75 to 90 minutes. And then your brain goes into a phase where it starts to thaw like a giant chicken, you know, to come awake. And when the alarm goes off, great, get up, you're in the thaw zone. Your brain is ready to start the day. If you hit the snooze button, like I used to hit the snooze button, and then you drift back to sleep, what do you suppose your mind drifts into? Sleep cycle. How long do those take? 75, yeah, 75 to 90 minutes. So when that alarm goes off 15 minutes later and you wake up, your brain is now trapped in a sleep cycle. Sleep researchers, psychologists, neurologists, they call it sleep inertia. If your brain is in a sleep cycle, it impairs your ability to process, to focus, to remember for four hours. So those of you that keep hitting the snooze button and then you spend the day going, oh my God, I didn't get enough sleep last night. Whoa, I feel so groggy. It's nothing to do with how much sleep you got. It has to do with the fact that you screwed yourself over. You basically put yourself back in a sleep cycle and then made yourself wake up and now you're walking around like the walking dead for four hours. So no snooze button. Not because it's enjoyable, but because that's what your brain needs, and that's what your business needs, and that's what you need in order to focus. Now, what do I want you to do? I want you to do something called 30 before 7.30. That means take 30 minutes. If you can't find 30 minutes, take five. What do you not see in this photo? Her phone. That's right. What are you doing during this time? So you've gotten, so the alarm went off. The phone wasn't there, so you didn't look at it. You had to get out of bed because you didn't hit the snooze button. You now find five to 30 minutes. I started calling this 30 before 7.30 because my first kid um, got on the bus at uh, 7 o'clock, so that was the first 30 minutes that I could find in the day where things weren't crazy, you know what I'm saying? And so this is what mine looks like. No makeup, pajamas, and no phone. Now what are you doing in those five to 30 minutes? You haven't looked at your phone yet, so you haven't let the craziness of the world into your mind. You have not been hijacked by the attention economy. You've woken up and your brain is ready to go. All I want you to do is I want you to just think about your day. Just think about your day. And here's something that I stole from the folks at Harvard Business School that has changed how I do my day. And that is, all I want you to do is figure out today what is one thing that I want to work on and one way that I can make progress. That's it. So you're going to wake up, not have your phone. You're going to sit down with a cup of coffee or tea, a glass of water, or whatever. You're going to find five to 30 minutes before you turn on the TV or turn on the radio or look at the social media. And you're going to ask yourself, what's the one thing I want to work on today? And what's one little puny thing that I can do to inch that thing forward? Can I send an email? Can I watch a video? Can I go through my social media and unfollow people that trigger me? 
Can I, um, you know, can I make a phone call? Can I read some of the latest training from Total Life Changes? Yeah, what can I do? What's one thing? That's all I want you to do every day, because if you just did one thing every day to inch this business forward for you, you would be shocked where you are a year from now. And I'm going to tell you, it begins and ends with you giving yourself the key time before the day starts. Don't your dreams deserve 30 lousy minutes? Doesn't your mental health deserve 30 lousy minutes? And you're not going to get it the rest of the day. You're just not. And so this has really changed my life. And so what do I do? The last thing I do at the end of the day, I charge my phone in the kitchen at night. That's what I do. That's what I do with our kids' phones, too. They stay in the kitchen or in the closet somewhere away. That's the last thing I do so that when I go into my bedroom, it's not there. I'm not even tempted. Those are five second habits that will fundamentally change your mindset. It'll change your sense of control. It will give you the little momentum every morning. And every single one of you can five five minutes in the morning. Every single one of you can charge the phone in the kitchen. And by the way, if you want to see a video where I explain this for free, I'm not selling you anything. We just get a lot of questions about this. You can just go to melrobbins.com slash free gift. It's a video explaining the science of all of this in even greater depth. And that's, uh, that's my thank you to you for inviting me here. So if this makes you nervous, good. That's right, good. Because you know what? Nerves are normal. Nerves are important. If you're not doing something once a week that makes you nervous, you should be. Because it means you're not doing anything new, you know? This is part of changing. And so now that I've given you the five second rule, five, four, three, two, one, you know how to push yourself, you know how to coach yourself, you know how to beat all the excuses, you know how to close the gap between thinking and doing, you know how to close the gap between doubting yourself and acting with confidence, you know how to close the gap between fear stopping you and being a little courageous. Now I want to give you a couple really cool tricks around dealing with nerves. Because now that you're going to push yourself, you're going to find yourself in situations that make you nervous. Awesome. I want you nervous at least once a week. I want you out on the edge. I want you feeling like, oh my gosh, can I do this? Can I do this? Well, we're going to, we're going to push you to do it. And so it's a medical fact that there's no difference in your body medically when you're in a situation that makes you nervous and a situation that makes you excited. No difference. Like, think about it. In a moment where you're really excited, your stomach has butterflies, right? Same thing's true when you're nervous. In a moment when you're really excited, your armpits, they sweat like Niagara Falls, right? Same thing when you're nervous. Your heart races, your throat gets tight, your hands get clammy. Medical fact. There is no difference between a situation that makes you nervous. I mean, is she nervous? Or is she excited? Whatever you're thinking, you're right, by the way. Because the, the only thing that's different between a situation that's supposedly making you nervous and excited is what your brain is saying about it. So the folks at Harvard Medical School wondered, geez, I wonder, since it's a medical fact that your body is exactly the same when you're nervous as when you're excited, could we trick your brain into thinking you're excited in a moment when you're nervous? The answer is yes, you certainly can. So let me show you the really awesome little trick. Because they tested this at Harvard Medical School, and it was fascinating. Every single student who was taught to, to do what I'm about to teach you before a standardized test performed better, before a track meet ran faster, before a negotiation competition did better. Here's the simple trick. The next time you're in a situation that makes you nervous, you're going to go, five, four, three, two, one. And then you're going to go, I am so excited to fire this person. No bad joke? Okay, well, that situation makes me nervous. Makes me very nervous. I'm so excited to give this presentation. I'm so excited to give this sample out. I am so excited, and something crazy is going to happen. Your body is going to settle, and you are going to perform better even though you feel nervous. And you're going to be shocked, just like Chris was shocked. I used the five-second rule before a presentation. I used nervous energy to be excited. It worked. Here's the reason why it works. If you're in a situation that makes you nervous and you allow your thoughts to spiral, 
Your own thoughts make your body state worse. When your body state starts to get even more agitated, cortisol, a stress hormone, hits your brain. When cortisol hits your prefrontal cortex, guess what happens? You can't remember what you prepared. You can't process as quickly. So it's not that your preparation in talking to people about this business wasn't good. It's that you allowed your own nerves to release cortisol, and that stopped you from leveraging what you know. It's absolutely amazing, and you need to know this because you're now going to be in situations, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, that really, really, really make you nervous, and that's good. Now you know all you have to do is be like, I'm so excited, I'm so excited, I'm so excited, and you will be startled by how well it works. Now I want to build on that and talk about anxiety, okay? And if you have children that struggle with anxiety, first of all, you're not alone, and secondly, I want you to pay attention because the five-second rule is a remarkable tool that you can use to help your children with anxiety. Now, we've seen a rise in anxiety with our own kids. I was speaking for a massive audience of pediatricians, and a pediatrician came up to me uh, a couple weeks ago after a speech and said, I'm so glad you're talking about this because, you know, a couple years ago, Mel, we would have three or four appointments a week where parents would raise anxiety as like an issue. I have five or six appointments a day where it's the primary thing they're coming in with. And I'm sure if you've seen a rise in your own family and you're worried about it, you know, I want you to know that you're not alone. The other reason why I talk about this is because when I talk about anxiety, it's personal. You know, a lot of people will look at me, particularly on stage or in the videos we put out online, and they're like, oh, Mel, whatever. She was just born confident and annoying. Annoying, for sure. Just ask my baby brother, Derek. Confident? No way. I think if you could be a baby that worries, that was me. I was the kind of kid that, like, my face would turn bright red when I got called on in class. And when I was in sixth grade, growing up in western Michigan, my parents, they sent me to Girl Scout camp in Pentwater. I was so homesick, they sent me home. I mean, do you know how homesick you need to be for trained adults to be like, uh, you need to leave? This is out of hand. By the time I was 19, it was panic attacks. By the time I was 21, it was full-blown anxiety disorder. And thank God a doctor put me on Zoloft. You know, I took that drug for 25 years. And I had no shame in that. I mean, it was a lifesaver for me. In fact, the only time I, I stopped taking it was when our now 20-year-old daughter was born. And I had such severe postpartum depression, like the really scary kind. I couldn't be left alone with our daughter for eight weeks. So when I talk about how you and I torture ourselves with how we think, I have lived this nightmare. Now, about five years ago, as the five-second rule started to spread around the world, and I was like overwhelmed with the stories coming in, something happens to you when you put something out in the world and it helps people change their lives, I know you feel that in your own business as a life changer, right? Like you feel like so humbled and you also feel a sense of responsibility, don't you? I felt a sense of responsibility to not only be able to explain why does something so simple work and help people, but I also felt a responsibility to take a look in the mirror and deal with my own demons. And so I thought, you know, I wonder if you could use the five-second rule to do things other than physical habits. I wonder if you could change mental habits. I wonder if you could change your mindset. I wonder if I could cure myself of anxiety. And the answer is, yep, you sure can. In fact, I've been off meds for five years. I haven't had a panic attack, a bout of anxiety. I don't even worry about anything. So. It's amazing. It is liberating. When you, when you embrace the idea, everybody, I want to tell you something. I don't know who trained you to talk the way that you talk to yourself. I don't know who trained you to think you're not worthy, or you're not good enough, or you're not likable. You're not to blame for that. But you have a responsibility to change how you talk to yourself. And I'm going to show you how you do that using science. Are you ready? It's amazing. 
And I'm going to use an example that many of you may be able to relate to, and that's the fear of flying. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the research you just learned from Harvard Medical School about reframing nerves into excitement. Because remember, nerves and excitement, the same thing. And the danger of allowing yourself to stay worried is that you agitate your body further. Believe it or not, there's a really tight connection between worry and anxiety. Worry is your thoughts being negative. Anxiety is when your thoughts get so negative your body starts to get worried. Okay, that's like the little sister and the big sister. A panic attack is when your body becomes so agitated that it's like, oh my God, I think I'm gonna die, and it takes over. It's like the mother, okay? So, I'm gonna use this example to break apart how we think and to show you how to use the I'm excited trick from Harvard Medical School along with something that we call an anchor thought that will anchor your thoughts down and retrain your brain. So the fear of flying. I used to be a real nervous flyer, meaning I was a real weirdo. I would get to the airport, like I'm going to go to the airport tonight for my flight at 6.30, and I would get to the gate, and I'd be looking around at the gate area, and I had this whole thing where I wanted to see three kinds of passengers, ladies and gentlemen. I want to see a baby. We got a baby. Yes. I want to see someone in a wheelchair, awesome. And I'd like to see men and women in the service. Because if those folks are getting on my plane, I could say, all right, God's not going to let this plane go down if they're on it, so it's safe to board, you know what I mean? <laughs> and then um, I would get to the, uh, the, the, the seat, and I would click that buckle, and the nerves would kick in, and the stomach would be in knots, and the armpits would be sweating like Niagara Falls, and my hands would get clammy, and start drinking water. <laughs> And, and if you were next to me as I started my breathing, you would literally be like, why me? Why me next to this freak? And so I would try to keep it together as the plane is taxiing. And then the plane would take off. And as it takes off, it's like, OK, it's going up, it's going up. And then you know how the plane takes off and then it levels off and it goes from like to and it feels like it's about to fall out of the sky at that point all bets are off i start having a panic attack i've grabbed you i'm hyperventilating i pull out my phone and i text chris and our three children mommy loves you heart emoji heart emoji because if this plane is about to crash I want my kids to know I tried to be the best mother that I could. And that way, at my funeral, when they deliver my eulogy, they can put those text messages in the PowerPoint, you know? And they can show you. And you giggle, because we're sick. We're sick human beings. If I were to put a speaker on your head and broadcast the garbage you say to yourself, you wouldn't be here with us in Dallas. You'd be in an institution. But you listen to it. You listen to it. You listen to it. Oh my god. Why do you listen to this? It's insane. You get an email from your boss, you're like, I'm fired. You know, you get an email from somebody in corporate, what did I do? You have to stop it. It is a habit. It's a pattern. That's all it is. And you can break it. And you can replace it. And if you use the five second rule for nothing else, please go to war against how you talk to yourself. It will not make you more money to keep saying this crap to yourself. You are worthy. You do deserve it. You are smart enough. You work hard. You are worthy of love. You are worthy of success. Period. End of story. Yes, you are. So here's how you do it. When I get on the plane, before I get on that plane, so before you go through your day, I know exactly what triggers me on the plane. It's when we hit turbulence. There's something about that metal tube bouncing around at 30,000 feet in the air that makes me a little nervous, you know what I mean? So I come up with an anchor thought. An anchor thought is any thought related to what you're about to do 
that excites you. So if you're nervous about sharing total life changes, come up with an anchor thought that makes you excited. Think about what you love about this stuff. Think about the fact that you're going to give people a gift. It's a free sample for crying out loud. Think about the impact this has made on your life. That's your anchor thought. If you have kids that struggle with anxiety, go through their day and talk about everything that makes them nervous and help them come up with another thought that could make them excited about what's going to happen. So I always think, if I'm flying back to Boston, I always think about, OK, what am I excited to do when I get home? Well, I'm excited to walk in the front door because we have a crazy 14-year-old son that always has some kind of wacko greeting, and I love it. And so when I get on the plane tonight, and we fly back east, and we bounce around over the rainstorms that hit the plains today, and my mind goes, oh my god, oh my god. Five, four, three, two, one. I am not thinking about that. I am interrupting that thought. I am yanking my thoughts forward to here, and I am dropping in an anchor thought. I am so excited to walk in the front door and see what he does tonight. Huh? Right? And so what happens? Nothing. It's amazing. What happens is I yank my thoughts to my, for, my prefrontal cortex. And because I'm now thinking about something that's related, my mind's like, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. She's not nervous about dying. She's excited to get home. That's it. So when you start to feel the butterflies coming, they're going to come. That's cool. You're stepping out of your comfort zone. I love that. Yay, you. Grow, do it. Then go, I'm so excited to make a difference. I'm so excited to have a team of people. I am so excited to change my own life. I am so excited to give this gift and share this sample. I am so excited to have this conversation and remove the garbage that is between me and my dad or my mom or my spouse or my kid. And that anchor thought will anchor you down. And what's amazing, we had somebody write to us, you guys. I'm so proud of this. We had somebody write to us two weeks ago that follows us online, learned this by just watching some videos that we put out, and she said her six-year-old was so overwhelmed with anxiety, she was getting physically ill before school, throwing up, that anxious, working herself into a tizzy. And she started using this simple formula I've just given to you. Go through your day. She's like, well, what are you worried about in the first period? What are you worried about in the second period? Okay, well, what can we think about that would be exciting? And what could you think about if you have to go to the nurse? And what could you... Do you know in two days, two days, using just the five-second rule, I'm excited and anchor thoughts, this little girl is no longer getting sick and, in fact, was bounding out of the car going, I am so excited, so excited. This stuff works, but it doesn't work if you don't use it. So if you don't think you have anxiety, I think you're wrong. I think we all do. Um, I love this email from Muhammad. Thank you, Mel. I had an important email to send, but I was afraid. How many of us have a, an email or a phone call, right? We're thinking about it. We're afraid. Why are we afraid? Because we're uncertain. That's all that, that triggers us. We're uncertain about how it's going to go. Do you know that thinking about it doesn't create certainty? The only thing that will give you certainty is you taking control in that five-second window, changing how you think, and taking control of what you do in response. And I'm telling you, the secret is just five seconds. That's it. You, just, you don't have to worry about the big stuff. You've got to worry about these five-second windows. You've got to worry about whether or not you got the clarity and the courage to hear the alarm and the power and the genius that is inside of you. And you, know, you can get resigned. I was resigned. I didn't think, how on earth? could simply getting my butt out of bed. How could that make a difference when our problems are so big? I'm telling you, you change your life one decision at a time. In fact, I think you're just one decision away from a totally different life. You're one decision away from not torturing yourself upstairs. It's the big stuff that you change with the littlest moments. Just ask Brittany and Todd. So today's Brittany's wedding day, and what you can't tell is it's been a terrible decade for the family because Brittany and Todd's mom got a divorce. And what are the rules of the divorce? Oh, you hate each other, and you fight like cats and dogs. You hire lawyers, and spend all your money, and you lose everything. And 
Finally, the dust settles and the divorce is final. And then what happens? Oh, everybody remarries, and it's like a big team sport of hate again. So, you know, he's walking his new wife up the aisle, and that alarm goes off. That alarm that's inside of you, that is trying to signal you to pay attention that there's magic here, there's connection here, there's change here, there's power here. That alarm goes off and it says, dude, you got to do something to heal this family. He sets his new wife down. He makes a five-second decision. There were a million reasons not to do what he did. But he turned around. He walked back. He grabbed this man. That's a man he hates. That's Brittany's stepdad. Just look at the lady next to them for crying out loud, you guys. <laughs> and invited him to walk their daughter down the aisle. One decision changes everything. Just ask his family. Hey, it's Mel. Thank you so much for checking this video out. And if you like this one, I have a feeling you're going to like this one too. I'll see you there.